This happened a few years ago, but I will never forget each detail of that cold night. I had just clocked in, 11.59 p.m., the graveyard shift. Call centers are not great. The pay is terrible, the hours are long and excruciating, and the clients treat you like trash. The only thing I liked about that place was my friends, David and Sophie. Oh, about time you showed up, Al. Did you punch in late again? Bullsman is going to have your balls. He joked, but I did have a problem with my tardiness. No, actually, I'm here early tonight. 11.59, I said. <laughs> we both laughed. David liked giving people a hard time, but that's how you knew he cared about you. I looked at the end of the row. Sophie had already logged into her tools and was taking a call. She'd always get admonished for logging in early. Work was everything for her, even this crappy job. Yeah, she's been like that for 10 minutes. She showed up and logged in, didn't even say hello. I meant to tell her her hair looked terrible tonight, but she wouldn't even give me that chance. Can you believe it? I chuckled and walked towards my station. It sat opposite Sophie's. When she saw me, she waved slightly in an almost dismissive way. It wasn't like her to do something like that. I took my seat and started working on my tools. Hey, what are you doing tonight, David? Sir? I'd tease him, calling him sir. He hated it, but he was also technically our supervisor, although he didn't care. He knew, as I knew, this was just another bullshit job. But over the next eight hours, I'd have to do it, and do it well. I was already on such thin ice with the company, always arriving late at the office. David remained quiet and then waved at Sophie, who was wrapping up her call. Hey, what's wrong? Bro, it looks like you've seen a ghost. Are you okay? Sophie and I approached his desk, and Sophie let out a shout. On his screen, there was a picture of a man sitting in a chair with a bag over his head. Behind him, a guy dressed in black, holding a gun to his head. This was on my email. It was marked as important. It has a video attachment. It wasn't a picture. It was a pause video. He pressed play, and the man in black stepped forward, weapon in hand, and shot the man sitting in the chair. Oh my God, what the hell, David? Sophie took a few steps back. We were all in shock. Damn, who sent that, David? I asked, but he kept staring at the monitor, almost in a state of trance. He clicked on the video again. It started from the beginning, and when the gunshot sounded, Sophie cried out, covering her ears. So I walked up to her and wrapped my arms around her shoulders. It's okay, calm down, so-so. We all had these dumb nicknames for each other. Why would you do that, David? Can you turn that off, please? She was right. David, man, quit it. Turn that stuff off. You're scaring Sophie. David? He was still very quiet. But when he turned and looked at me, his eyes were dark, wide open like plates and full of fear. Hey, Albert, don't you recognize that room? His voice was trembling. I took a look. It was a break room with tables, chairs, and a fridge. No, not just a break room. Oh my God, is that our break room? I began to shake as well. No, no, no. It sure is. That's our damn break room. David suddenly stood up. I'm going to check it out. Are you insane? Sit down. We need to stay together. She's right, David. Let's stick together. I'm going to call 911 and we can all leave. God, Albert, don't be an idiot. You know what that is? It's a joke. Someone is playing a trick on us. Now you can stay here like babies or you can... All lights went out and we were surrounded by complete darkness. Everything was off. Our computers, the lights on the ceiling. We looked out the window and many neighboring buildings were out of power as well. Oh God, oh no. Sophie was freaking out. So I grabbed her again and said, calm down. It's a power outage, okay? We've gone through these before. She kept freaking out. So I took out my phone and turned on the flashlight. It didn't do much, but it illuminated the place well enough. David did the same. That's when we heard the glass breaking. From the back of the office floor, near the break room, came the sound of breaking glass, as if someone had just broken a window with a heavy object. Sophie covered her mouth and dropped to the floor. I shone my light at her, and I saw her quivering behind a desk. Grab her! Let's go! At that moment, I flashed my light down the hall. It was very faint and I could not illuminate the whole place. But in the distance, next to the break room door, I saw someone move. I looked at David, and he was standing next to the row of desks. His expression was horrible. His mouth was open, his eyes were wider than before. He looked at me and said, Albert, 
Why are you pointing the light at me? Are you cr We heard a gunshot, and before I knew it, Albert was grabbing his chest, falling backward, crashing against the desk. I looked again and blood was falling between his fingers. When he tried to talk, he spat blood. Moments later, he was dead. I felt hands grab onto me. They were strong, probably a man's, and then a thick muscular arm was surrounding my neck. I couldn't breathe. The phone had fallen on the floor, the light pointing up at the ceiling, illuminating our desk row. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Sophie cowering under the desk, sitting in a fetal position, arms around her legs, looking at me. She was terrified, but I need her to move and do something. So I extend my arm to her, pleading. It took her a second, but just as I was about to pass out, I saw her move. Suddenly, the arm that gripped me had let go. The man in black, the one from the video, was on the floor, grabbing his side. He was bleeding. Oh, God, thank you, I said to Sophie, but she just took a step back. The man on the floor was bleeding from the side, and she had a knife in her hand. I, I took this. He had it on his leg. I looked. She was right. There was a sheath attached to the man's black boot. It was now empty, its knife in Sophie's hand. You did good. Let's go, I yelled. Oh, you two bastards better run. The man was on his knees now, and with his hand, he was fumbling, trying to get something from inside his coat. I kicked him in the face as hard as I could, grabbed Sophie's hand, and we started running. As soon as we made it to the access hall, also in complete darkness, we saw a green light at the end of the hallway. It was the green exit sign. The emergency backup kept those lights on. We started running at the sign. We heard gunshots and more broken glass behind us. The stranger had begun to scream. The exit sign led to the emergency stairs. We took them and started going down. We were on the sixth floor, but we ran down as fast as we could. Above us, the door busted open and gunshots began to rage inside the staircase. Then, when we finally made it to the ground floor lobby, we thought we'd be safe. We opened the door to the street and a dark, tall figure rushed from outside tackling Sophie and bringing her to the ground. No, please! The impact of the door had pushed me back, and I fell. But I tried to run towards her. I saw the knife in his hand, high in the air, and then it came down. Sophie yelled and then made no more sounds. She was gone. The man turned around. He removed his hood. I couldn't recognize him. Shame. I wanted to have a little fun first. The man began rushing at me. It seemed he only had a knife. I began to run away into the freezing night. Behind me I heard shots and the angry voices of the two men. I just kept running. I turned around the corner and saw a patrol car parked by the sidewalk. The police officer was drinking a coffee, sitting on the car's hood. He looked at me and must have assumed something was wrong. Hey kid, can I help you? I work around the street. Someone broke into our building and, and they just killed my friends. I was shaking, but he took me into the car, made a few calls over the radio, and I was taken to the station. It's been a few years now. I've helped the police in their investigation however I could. No lead so far. I've been going to therapy, and I'm still having trouble processing everything that happened that night. I keep looking over my shoulder when I walk outside at night. I just hope that by telling this story to someone, I can begin to heal. All I know is that I miss my friends and I hope one day I can get justice for them. Being a mom to a teenage son is not easy. It's even more difficult if you have to raise him alone. My husband committed suicide when Henry was two years old. It was a Sunday morning. Henry was playing with his dad in the backyard and I went to get groceries. When I came home, I found the house excessively quiet. I looked through the kitchen window and saw Henry was standing outside, staring at the big tree in the corner. Coming out, I saw the most sickening sight of my life. My husband was hanging by a rope from a branch of that tree, and Henry was standing under it, watching his dad's dead body like a statue. The shock of this violent incident shook him to such an extent that after that, my son wasn't my son anymore. His psychiatrist says he's lost the ability to be shaken, at least in an emotional way, and that's true. My son isn't scared of anything anymore. 
He's 13 years old now, doesn't talk to anyone, spends most of his time in his room. I'm always worried sick about him. Recently, I had to withdraw him from school. He was being bullied a bunch of times. Not once did he fight back. It's not that I want my son to go out in a fighting rage, but his teacher said the other day, three boys were kicking him while he lay still on the ground. After a point, he just got up laughing weirdly as if he was enjoying the pain. His lips were bleeding, and he licked off the blood while saying, <laughs> It tastes good. I'm homeschooling now, but recently, he's built up a strange fascination. He likes watching mukbang videos. That's the one time I see his eyes dazzle. Some of my friends told me it can be a stress-relieving experience. Thinking it would give him peace of mind, I went with it for a couple of days, but suddenly, something weird happened. It was 1.30 a.m. when I heard sounds downstairs. I went to Henry's room, but he wasn't there. I slowly came downstairs and saw my son sitting on the table watching a video of a woman eating live spiders. Henry, what are you doing here? Um, I was thinking to open a channel of my own. Of what? I want to make videos like this. Will you help me? Okay. Go to sleep now. We'll talk about this tomorrow, okay? He looked at me with a blank face, then went upstairs murmuring, I would love to make videos like this. I would love to eat. <laughs> the next day, I called his psychiatrist and told him everything about that night. The psychiatrist told me that I should support Henry. This might strengthen our bond and also distract his mind to a new dimension. So I sat him down and said I would help him. I took him grocery shopping where he bought a bunch of ready-to-eat snacks. Coming home, he placed a video camera on the table and started eating snacks one by one. Soon, I got used to this. I subscribed to his channel, and my son found a new identity over social media. Being a teenager, I just let him be, because he had already been through a lot, and for the first time he wanted to do something on his own. His videos started low-key. He had 400 to 500 subs, and every week uploaded a new video. At first, I watched all of his videos, but soon lost interest. It was him eating chocolates or fried chicken, sitting at the dinner table. Henry was a well-built teenager, but due to his mental illness, his face looked pale most of the time. One morning, when I woke up and checked my phone, I found a notification. It was Henry's mukbang video that he had uploaded last night. The title read, Delicious Earthworms. I sprung from my bed and played the video. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My 13-year-old son was eating live earthworms in front of the camera. He was grabbing a handful of crawling worms from a mud-filled pot and shoving them inside his mouth. Some worms were trying to come out from his mouth while he chewed on them mercilessly. Half-eaten chunks were dropping on the table while he was drooling in a very scary way. His face looked horrifying as he went on smacking the worms like french fries. I went to his room and saw him sitting in front of the computer. He was reading the comments on his recently uploaded video. Look, Mom! My videos have got 15k views! I just got 200 subs this morning! People are finally paying attention to me! <laughs> I can't believe this! I finally exist! <laughs> I saw it at that very moment. I knew my son was not well at all, and I had always struggled to accept the fact. I sat close to him and said in a caring voice, But Henry, this is very disturbing. You're not supposed to eat worms. Let's go to your psychiatrist. You're not well. I'm not going anywhere. Stop telling me that I am sick. The reason I didn't fight back those bullies was that their kicks made me bleed and I liked how blood tasted. I want to try new things and create an identity of my own. I'm tired of being the boy who watched his father commit suicide, okay? Fine. You sit here. I'll call your therapist. I turned around to get my phone from my room when something heavy and blunt hit me at the back of my head and everything went black in front of my eyes. I could feel my hands and legs tied with tape while someone kept dragging me down. Wh what's happening? Henry? Don't you worry. Just sleep. All will be fine. I wanted to ask more questions, but I passed out with a throbbing pain once again. I don't exactly remember how long I was out. Splashes of water touched my face, and I woke up feeling confused and clueless. Henry was standing right next to me and watching me. 
His eyes were burning with evil intentions. He smiled like a psycho and said, Guess what, Mom? You are my new addition. He then looked at the camera, pointed right at us, and said, Hi, guys. Today I will go live. Like I promised, I will be tasting blood today. And guess what? My mom is going to volunteer. What? Are you insane? You're going to drink your mother's blood on a live telecast? What the hell is wrong with you, Henry? Guys, don't mind her reactions. She's not a camera person, so let's start. Henry walked up to the sink and took out a big knife from the knife stand. He started walking at me. Henry, untie my hands. Right now. This is my final warning. Untie me. Now. Relax, Mom. I am not going to kill you. You'll only be a test kit. (laughs) I was sweating in fear. My son was coming at me with a knife. God, how did I let it escalate to such a level? Henry came near me and cut my cheek. I screamed in pain as blood dripped from the wound. He licked the blood off my face while making direct eye contact with the camera and said, Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. (laughs) He went on, making small cuts on my hands, neck, and licking the blood. I started sobbing while my sick son pulled off this madness. I was screaming for help and crying out loud when our front door broke down. My next-door neighbor rushed in with the cops, and they finally arrested my son. My neighbor had heard screaming coming from my house and called the cops. My son is now admitted to a mental institution. They have to give him electric shocks as a treatment. He now barely recognizes me. The last time I went to talk to him, he did something horrible. We were standing in the hallway. I was trying my best to remind him about his house and how much I love him when he looked into my eyes and said, Hey, are you going to eat that? What? Eat what? Without responding to my answer, he grabbed a lizard crawling on the wall and tore its head from the body. As the blood started to drip from it, he opened his mouth wide and started to drink the lizard's blood. Nurses came running, hearing my scream, and they dragged him back to his cabin. As I kept screaming in fear, my son just laughed at me. It's delicious, Mom! Try it! Just try it! It's delicious. (laughs) I don't work late night shifts anymore. This happened last year, in December. I took a job in a local department store. Generally, I was assigned to do the evening shifts, but that day I decided to cover for another worker who was on leave. Who can say no to extra cash? The store was located in the outskirts, mainly for people driving by the highway. There was a petrol pump three blocks away, and that's the only residence close to this store. I drove to work in my car and never had any issues working there. But being my first graveyard shift, I was quite nervous. I carried pepper spray in my pocket just in case. Apart from that, I had no other weapon with me, as I never expected something like this would happen. It was a Tuesday night and I was sitting behind the counter watching videos on my phone when I heard a rustling sound. The department store is made of glass, so you can see the outside quite clearly. I looked around, but except for the vast fields and empty highway, I saw nothing. It was 1.30 in the morning and I braced myself, saying a couple of more hours and then I'll be going home. A minute went by when that rustling sound took place again. I grabbed a flashlight and went out of the store. Is anyone out here? Hello? Ah! Hearing this spine-chilling scream out of nowhere, I dropped my flashlight in a panic and ran toward the store. I could hear footsteps running behind me but didn't have the guts to turn around. As soon as I got inside the door, I slammed the glass door and locked it right away. My heart was beating like a drum. I kept staring outside, hoping to see the person who chased me, but shockingly, there was still no one to be seen. I wiped the sweat from my forehead and drank some water. I was finally settling down, thinking someone had played a disgusting prank on me when I heard a tapping sound. I slowly lifted my face and saw a freaky-looking man standing outside the glass with an expressionless face. He had long hair, dressed in his pajamas with no socks or shoes. It was a chilly winter night, and I was shocked to see him standing there in minimal clothing. He kept staring at me in a very creepy way. 
I was taken aback by this scenario and forgot to move. The man wasn't even blinking. His eyes were still, like a dead fish. After staring at me like this for a few seconds that felt like an eternity, by the way, the man raised his bony finger and tapped on the glass. Tap, tap, tap. My knees started to tremble in fear, but somehow I got my shit together and said in a fumbling voice, What do you want? A dirty, ear-to-ear -ear smile appeared on his face. He shushed me, putting his finger over his lips, and then started to walk in the weirdest way possible. He was tiptoeing in a very exaggerated way, pulling his knees up very high and grinning. He started counting as well. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three, turn. One, two, three. I watched him pull off this crazy charade. He was walking back and forth, raising his knees really high like a creepy cartoon character, while counting one, two, three. I wanted to call the cops, but what would I complain about? Though this man was a nut job, he didn't try to break in or do anything harmful yet. So I walked behind the counter, sat down, keeping my calm, and just prayed to God to make him go away. After going on like this for five minutes straight, he stopped and smelled the air like a dog. Trust me, he was completely insane. He then pressed himself on the glass and spoke to me. Come out and play with me, Isabel. <laughs> what? I am not Isabel. Are you alright? Stop lying to me! Just come out and play! I didn't know what to say. The man kept staring at me, probably waiting for me to come out. When he saw I wasn't moving an inch, his demeanor changed drastically. He started hitting the glass with his fists while screaming. Don't you dare ignore me! Come out! Come out now! Look, you're mistaken. I'm not Isabel. You think you can lie to me? You have fooled me for a long time, but not anymore. I've watched you coming here for days. They thought I'll never find you. <laughs> so wrong. They were so wrong. I'm telling you for the last and final time, go away or I'll call the cops. Come out, come out. Now, you have to play with me as we used to. Remember how you lifted your skirt when I asked you to? And let me play as long as I want. <laughs> Let's do that again. Come out, come out. His words drove me crazy. What the hell was he even saying? I couldn't hold back anymore. I dialed 911 and reported this man. The operator told me not to panic and wait for the cops to arrive. Meanwhile, the crazy man just stood there screaming and banging on the glass. When he realized I wasn't going to come out or let him in, he took a few steps back and spit on the glass while cursing me. He then licked his own spit from the glass. Go away, you jerk! Bloody psycho! When you get home, I want you to call your mom and tell her that Jones is a free man now. She can't save her daughter again. <laughs> Saying this, he walked away and disappeared into the darkness. The cops came, and I couldn't help but burst into tears explaining what a horrible time it was. I told them everything about this guy, and after the cops escorted me home, I called my boss and took a week off. The next morning, I called my mom and told her about my encounter with this crazy guy. I expected her to be worried, but she kind of froze on the phone. Mom? Are you there? What, what did he call you, Susie? Isabel, why do you ask? Listen to me very carefully. I'll be there in the evening. I want you to lock your doors and don't come out until you hear my voice. Just do as I say, I'll explain everything to you. My mom disconnected the call and I was even more worried. Was the man telling the truth? Did he know me? Did he know my mom? I couldn't eat, sleep, do anything until my mom came over. She hugged me while whimpering like a kid. What she told me afterward changed my life forever. You're not supposed to remember this. It happened in the early years of your childhood. Every Sunday, you used to go to the city park with grandma and play with the neighborhood kids. 
There used to be a balloon vendor who gave away free balloons to kids sometimes. You two became good friends, but soon we realized something wasn't right about this man. One day, you asked me for chocolates, and when I said no, you lifted your skirt and said if I gave you the chocolate, you'll let me play with you. Susie, we found out that the man molested you and many other kids too. He took them into the bushes, promising free balloons and traumatized them for life. Your father and I immediately reported him and he went to prison. We wanted to erase this memory from your mind, so we took you to a psychiatrist. Due to her therapy, this memory faded with time. I never thought that scum would be set free and that he would have the guts to find you again. I've already talked to the chief, and he'll be behind bars soon. After hearing this, I couldn't speak for a while. My skin crawled, thinking the ugliest things he might have done to me, and now I don't even remember them. I was broken and confused at the same time. The cops eventually caught the guy, and a court hearing took place, questioning the authorities under what circumstances would they let someone like that walk the streets again. After getting out, this man came looking for me, and God knows for how many days he kept an eye on me waiting for an opportunity but as I worked the day shift, he couldn't come near me. It makes me freeze in fear when I think how he recognized me after all these years. Now I work at a different place, but I don't think I'll ever be ready to work night shifts again. I hope that guy rots in jail and dies there too. I just hope that this time, he stays behind bars for the rest of his pathetic, ugly life. The internet can be a messed up place for messed up people. A few years ago, there was a real popular craze with this website called Omegle. It lets you video chat with random people from around the world. It's pretty crazy. That night, a few friends and I were back at my place, and we were trying Omegle for the very first time. Steve had told us how he met this girl using Omegle, and they were going on a date that Sunday. She's so cool, you guys! Like, we're basically the same person, and to be honest, he wouldn't shut up about her. Then there was Marco. Marco was shy and calm, the polar opposite of Steve. I wouldn't date someone I met on the internet, but tell us how it goes. Maybe she's cool. Steve seemed offended by that, but he let it slide. Sure, bud. Come on, let's get this started. I got to the website, checked my camera and the microphone. Everything was ready. We spoke to some people. Some of them were cool, some were clearly weird. One good thing about Omegle is that it allows you to skip people, so when something goes wrong, you can always get out of there. And then we met him. We still didn't know his name, but when we started talking to him, we noticed the skip button was grayed out. We could not click it. He introduced himself as Marco, the name of my friend. Hello, my name is Marco. I go to Riverside High, and I'm the president of the chess club. Now this may sound normal to you, but the scary thing was that it was the perfect description of my friend, Marco. Riverside High School was our school, and Marco was the president of the chess club. To make matters worse, this other Marco was wearing the same shirt as our friend. I looked to the side, and Marco was trembling with fear, his eyes wide open, looking at the screen. What the hell? Is this some sort of prank? Who put you up to this? The guy on the screen, this doppelganger, simply smiled. I told you. You guys, I'm Marco. Who was that guy next to you? Quit messing around. This is Marco. You're some idiot who's pranking us. No, I'm your friend. That's not the real Marco. Come on, Steve, Peter, it's me. He did look identical to Marco. Oh, come on, guys. Shut it off. This is freaking me out. Do not shut this down. Guys, that guy is not me. He's going to hurt you. Okay, enough. I don't know who you are, but this is our friend and you're not going to mess with us. You're not the real deal, Marco. Oh, yeah? Then how did I get inside this room? He pulled back and showed us. The posters of that girl from Queen's Gambit, the chessboards, and the checkered drapes on the window. That was Marco's room. He was at his home. How did you get in my house? Marco was standing up, trembling. He'd gone pale. Because this is my house. I'm calling the cops. I'm calling my parents. Marco got his phone and dialed up his parents, putting them on the speakerphone. Mom, Mom, is that you? Yes. Sweetheart, what's wrong? Marco froze. 
How could he explain this? Mom, when's the last time you saw me? Marco had just left home after dinner to come to my place. We lived a few blocks away. His mom's answer chilled us to the bone. What do you mean, silly? I saw you two minutes ago when you went up to your room. Marco nearly fell on his butt. I looked at the screen and the imposter was smiling ear to ear. Mom, that's not me. I don't know who it is, but whoever is in the house, it's not me. Please call the cops. Don't be silly, honey. I'll come up right now. I needed to talk to you anyway. No, Mom, please don't. She had hung up. A couple of minutes later, we saw it all unfold. On the screen, the imposter was laughing, but he was very still. A moment later, the door opened behind him, and when Marco's mom approached the imposter, he turned around in his chair. The woman clearly did not recognize him and stepped back, but he stood up and jumped on her, tripping her and sending her to the ground. No! Mom! A moment later, the imposter stood up and looked at the screen. He was covered in blood and holding a knife in his hand. Look at what you did to your mom! Marco was on his knees. He could not stop crying. You just killed your mama! <laughs> the man on the screen began laughing hysterically. <laughs> and now you're gonna kill your dad and your little sisters! Steve was the only one who snapped everyone out of it. He stood up, went to the back of my computer, and pulled the plug. Let's go! He yelled the order, and we started running down the stairs. My parents asked what was happening, so I told them, Something bad happened at Marco's place. Please call 911 and tell them to go there immediately. We made it to the street, and we ran to Marco's house. When we got there, it was too late. The door was open, and all the lights were out. When we came into the hallway, there were blood splatters on the wall, and in the living room, there were the bodies of Marco's dad and his two little sisters. Marco fell to the floor, shaking and crying. Goddamn bastard! A few moments later, the police showed up and took Marco away. We told them everything that had happened, but they did not believe it. An identical doppelganger? They thought we were crazy. But we all know what we saw. Marco moved in with me, and over time, we bonded. He became a brother to me, and we've moved on with our lives. Except for the fact that they never caught the doppelganger. I know Marco will not rest until he finds out what happened to his family. I'm petrified of this dating app, Tinder. It provides the golden opportunity for stalking and harming people. Tinder just gives the creeps out there an easy way out, I believe. And I have enough evidence to support my accusation. I live with my roommate, Tony, who is a naive and whimsical guy. He has a good heart and sometimes is too good for this world. Tony, Cameron, and I are the trio in our college. Many addressed us as the three musketeers as we are always hanging out with each other. Cameron stayed in an apartment two blocks away from ours with his girlfriend, Riley. Riley hosted many parties, so on weekends, Tony and I used to chill out at their place. Tony was shy when it came to talking to girls, and all our friends often mocked him for it. One Saturday evening, we were watching a football game at Cameron's place. Riley was having a sleepover at his sister's house, so it was just the three of us. Cameron handed Tony a beer and said, Dude, you should try Tinder. I don't know, I, I chicken out in front of girls. That's why Tinder will be perfect for you. Talk to her as long as she doesn't ask you to meet her. At least you'll get laid for once. <laughs> I too laughed hearing this. And within the next few hours, Cameron forcefully installed Tinder on Tony's phone. We made him an account, and that's how this entire prank started. The entire night, we made fun of him and then drank ourselves to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, I found myself lying on the floor with a massive headache. Tony was passed out on the couch and Cameron came out from the kitchen with a mug of hot coffee. Drink this. You'll be fine. <sighs> last night was too much. I did something last night, but you can't tell Tony. Promise me. What? What did you do? I created a fake account and matched it with Tony's. <laughs> now when he will wake up, he will meet 
Sarah. <laughs> we can have some fun for a while. Man, I don't think that's nice. You know how naive he is. What if this little joke ends up being a big mistake? Oh, come on. We will tell him later. Relax. Nothing will go wrong. After that day, Cameron started to text Tony from his fake Sarah account. And for a while, Tony too couldn't believe his luck. We were sitting in the college canteen one afternoon when Cameron asked, So, how is it going between you and Sarah? Can't tell. She texts me at random times and her profile picture doesn't show her face. Who wants to see her face? Shut up, Cameron. I just wish I could meet her and talk to her in person. Well, I think that will be too early. You guys just started talking. And like I said, wait for her to ask you out. Really? What do you think, Matthew? I hesitated, because now I will have to make up something too. Um, yeah, you should wait for her to make the move. Okay, if you guys say so. After this interaction in the cafeteria, I pulled Cameron aside in the hallway. Cameron, what the hell are you doing? Just end this and tell Tony the truth. Jeez, you are getting on my nerves. Fine, I'll tell him tonight. I came home thinking... If Cameron doesn't tell Tony the truth tonight, then I will. I took a shower and heard Tony's phone beeping with messages. Damn, he is still pulling this weird shit out. I then went out to pick up our dinner from the Chinese place nearby when Tony called me. Hey, what is it? Um, did you take the keys? No, why? I have to go out. Sarah texted me that she wants to meet me at the city park. Now. Oh, I see. I knew this was Cameron's showdown, so I went on with his prank for one last time. I told Tony to leave the keys under the mattress. He thanked me and left to make a fool of himself. As soon as I got off the phone with Tony, I dialed Cameron to give him a final warning, but he didn't pick up my call. Realizing he was ignoring me, I called his girlfriend Riley. As she answered, I couldn't hold myself anymore. Riley. Please tell Cameron to stop this nonsense. Why did he tell Tony to go to the city park? How long is he going to stretch this stupid prank? Whoa, whoa, slow down, Matthew. What are you saying? Cameron didn't say anything like that to Tony. You don't know? He is using a fake profile in Tinder to make fun of Tony. He just texted Tony. Please, just let me talk to him. No, you're not getting it. Cameron can't text Tony or anyone because he just lost his phone while coming home. Someone stole his phone during his bus ride. That dumbass didn't even put a lock on his phone. He's gone to the police station to file a complaint. There's no way he can contact Tony. Wait, does that mean the person who has his phone? Oh my God. I didn't let Riley finish and started to run in the direction of the park. It was 7.30 already and I was very well aware of how stranded the park gets after dark. Whoever stole Cameron's phone is now trying to trap Tony using his fake Tinder account. I tried calling Tony again and again, but my call was going straight to his voicemail. I prayed to God for his safety. I wasn't looking anywhere, just pushing people away from my way and running at full speed. Within seven minutes, I reached the park gate. There was no one around. I started to look around in that huge deserted park. Tony! Tony, where are you? I was calling out to him, but I heard nothing back. I must have searched for a minute when I heard voices coming from a distance. I slowly tiptoed to a bush and peeked in. What I saw made my heart skip a beat. Tony was lying unconscious on the ground under a tree, and a man was lunged over him. There was a big scar on Tony's forehead, and a bloody rock was lying next to him. It seemed like this man hit him on the head unexpectedly. The man seemed very weird and freaky. He was staring at Tony's face with a hungry look. At the first glance, I thought he was probably planning to rob my friend, but what he did next made me nauseous. He inserted his fingers inside his drooling mouth and dipped them in his sloppy saliva. But he didn't just stop there.
He then shoved his spit-covered fingers inside my unconscious friend's mouth and started to enjoy every moment of it. His face clearly showed his sick intentions that crowded his mind quite immediately. After gazing at my unconscious friend for a few seconds, he started to unbutton Tony's shirt while whispering, I can be your Sarah. I can give you all the love you'll ever need. He then ran his filthy fingers over Tony's bare chest and went close to kiss him on the lips. By now, I figured out that this man had no weapon. Without wasting any more time, I jumped at this man and pushed him away from my friend. Keep your filthy hands off my friend, you jerk! <laughs> the man couldn't keep his balance and slipped on the rock falling hard on his face. I heard his nose break as he hit the rocky ground. He started screaming in terrible pain while holding his bloody nose. His screams woke Tony up. Also, a patrolling security guard came running towards us. I explained to him everything, and he called the cops while keeping an eye on that man. What... what happened? Where am I? It's all right. I'm here. Can you walk? I... I think so. Why is my shirt unbuttoned? And who is this guy? I'll tell you later. For now... It's enough to know that this man deserves this. Let's go. The man sat quietly until the cops came. His eyes were burning with anger, but he knew I was stronger than him. I helped Tony to get up and then took him to the nearest hospital. Cameron and Riley came within some time after I called them and told them everything. Cameron apologized to Tony and was about to cry for doing this silly prank. I gave him his phone back, which I picked up from the ground when that freak slipped and fell. I am just happy that I reached him in time before that man had done something more damaging to my friend. Tony has become even more reserved now. I know it will take time to get out of this trauma, but whenever he asks me what that man was doing after he passed out, I tell him he was trying to rob him and nothing else. I will never tell him what kind of sick and twisted thoughts that man had for Tony that night. I was sitting behind the counter, waiting for a customer to arrive. I never liked working the graveyard shift, but who can refuse extra money? A tumultuous thunderstorm was going outside, making the glass door shudder. My phone started to drain out. Once it finally switched off, I plugged it into the charger. Now I was even more bored, with nothing to do, sitting in an empty Dunkin' Donut shop. I decided to make myself a cup of coffee so that I didn't doze off on my shift. There are times when all I want is to be alone, but standing in Dunkin' Donuts that night in the middle of a thunderstorm made me feel weird. My uncle owns this shop. I go to college and work part-time here. I sat down at a corner table with a cup of coffee. The storm was getting louder and stronger. I was about to take another sip when the power went out, and at the same time, the entrance doorbell rang. Someone had entered the shop. I don't panic easily, so I said, Uh, sorry, the power went out. Please, stay where you are. I somehow made my way to the counter and lit up a candle. As I lifted the candle to see ahead, a pale-faced woman appeared from the dark. Whoa! You scared me, ma'am. She looked extremely scared and mysterious at the same time. Her hair was all messed up. The trousers she wore were torn in places, and her white shirt had dried bloodstains. Oh my god, what happened to you? Did you have an accident? You... you have to help me. I think we should sit down. You seem hurt. No, we don't have much time. He'll be here any minute now. What? Who? What are you talking about? The man who's after me. He'll be here soon. You must call the cops. Is someone trying to kill you? He has done this before. He won't hesitate to do it again. I've seen other bodies in his house. He lures women into his trap and then kills them. I'm telling you, this guy is crazy. Please, you need to call the cops. Okay. Okay, I'll call the cops now. I grabbed my phone, but remembered it needed charging. 
There was a payphone outside, so I looked at the woman and said, Ma'am, I'll go out and call 911. There's a washroom at the back. Go there and clean yourself up. Don't worry. I won't let anyone hurt you. She seemed a little calmed down hearing this. I watched her walk away. She had no shoes and her feet were dirty and burnt in places. It seemed from her attire that she had seen horrible days. I grabbed an umbrella and went outside. The heavy wind almost blew me away. The sharp raindrops pierced my skin. I walked to the payphone and dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go on. I'm calling from an outlet of Dunkin' Donuts at Highway 14. I have a customer who is badly hurt. She's talking about a man chasing her and killing women. I'm scared, you've gotta send some cops here. Don't panic, ma'am. Is it only the two of you inside the shop right now? Yes, she's in the washroom, and I came out to call you on the payphone nearby. Okay, get inside, lock the doors, and wait for the cops. It's storming badly, so it might take some time to reach your location. But don't panic. Help is on the way. As I disconnected the 911 call and turned around, bright headlights fell on my face. A blue truck stopped near me. Before I could see the driver, the lights came back and I ran inside the shop. My uncle kept a baseball bat behind the counter. I placed it near me so I could use it if needed when the driver of the blue truck entered the shop. A man in his late 40s with a finely shaved face and deep green eyes walked up to the counter. I could see the washroom door in the corner. The woman was coming out, but as soon as she noticed this newly arrived guest, she hid behind the door, shivering in fear. Our eyes met and she nodded her head in yes while pointing her finger at him. So this was the guy she was talking about. I knew the cops were on their way, so all I had to do was keep him there until they arrived. I contained myself and said in a cheerful voice, Welcome to Dunkin' Donuts. May I take your order, sir? It's one hell of a storm, no? Um, yeah, well, at least the power came back. What would you like to have, sir? Yeah, let me ask you a quick question. Is it only me and you in here? I realized he was looking for the woman and trying to find out if she had come here or not. Um, yeah? Why do you ask? Nothing. Just, uh general query. So, what's your name? I was stunned to see his chilled out attitude toward me. While asking me all these unnecessary questions, he was observing me in a very creepy way, but I didn't lose my calm. Uh, sir, it's late and I'm about to close the shop, so can you please tell me what you'd like to order? Close the shop? But isn't it a 24-7 open policy? Yes, but the shop belongs to my uncle, and now I'm in charge, so I'm asking you for the last and final time, are you going to order anything? The man's eyes ignited like a vulture. He came close to me and said, You shouldn't be making me angry. After all, it's only you and me in here. <laughs> But before he could do anything more, I picked up the baseball bat and hit him hard on the head. He fell on the floor, screaming in pain while holding his bleeding head. You bitch! Seems like you just can't wait to die like the others. Listen, you freak! The cops are on their way, and I know who you are. I know you're looking for that woman, but this time, I'm not letting you hurt her. Woman? Which woman? Her! Come out, man. You don't have to be scared anymore. The woman came out, but this time, she didn't look afraid. She was smiling. As soon as she came in front of him, the man started to head back in fear. He was crawling backwards like he couldn't believe his eyes. You, but- You can see me too, huh? The question she just asked surprised me. Why wouldn't he see her? She's standing right in front of him. Just then, I heard the cop cars approaching the shop, and I yelled, You're going to jail, you psycho freak! The cops came in and arrested the man, but he wasn't in his sense. He fainted in fear and the cops had to carry him to the car. I walked them out and thanked the cops for arriving at the right moment. The sheriff came to me and asked about the injured woman. I told him she was inside. We all went back, but the woman was gone. I searched the washroom, but she was nowhere to be found. While we were looking for her inside the Dunkin' Donuts shop, we heard two cops screaming outside. Sheriff Ronald, come out. Come out. Quickly! The sheriff ran outside, hearing them, and I too followed. The cops were standing near the blue truck, staring at it with a horrified look on their faces. As I walked close to the truck, I felt the ground sweep under my feet. My body froze, and I was out of words. 
At the back of the truck laid a dead woman wrapped in a black plastic sheet. I had no difficulty recognizing her. She was the same woman who entered the shop right after the power cut. The story unfolded that the man's name was Mark and he was a serial killer. He picked up women hitchhikers and then abducted them. He kept them in his secluded cabin. There, he used to torture them and later killed them. The police found four bodies in his cabin. That night, he came looking for his sixth victim, me. It's a miracle that I'm still alive, but what still gives me goosebumps is that one of his dead victims came to save my life that night. Now, I understand why she asked him. You can see me too. <laughs> I think there's something in my house, and I'm not just saying it. My name is Lucy Barbera, and I live in the outskirts of Ohio. I was married to a man named Daniel two years back. He used to be a worker in my father's factory. My father grew fond of him and arranged my marriage with him. I never had much say when it came to my life. My father was a strict man, and after my mother's death in my early childhood, he raised me with all he had. I'm not saying he didn't love me, but he did show too much authority over me. He thought, whatever he thinks, he decides will be best for me. Not having enough self-esteem, I could never stand up to him. When I turned 18 and finally thought of doing so, he got diagnosed with cancer. His last wish was to see me settled by marrying this man, Daniel. Daniel was a bit older than me, but he was a hard worker and had some family wealth. He too was an orphan, so my father immediately took him under his wing. My father died a week after our marriage. <laughs> Daniel wasn't a talker, and he was way more reserved than I anticipated at first. But the thing I respected about him was he never forced me into anything as my father did. After getting married, I moved in here to live with him. He took over my father's business and managed it. Despite being married, we kept our distance. Everything was going okay until last Thursday, when my husband died. Yes, Daniel's dead. In his last few months, Daniel worked late night in his study downstairs. He said he was working on a new business strategy. I knew how extremely serious he was about work, so I never bothered him. But it was 3.10 in the morning when I sprung up, hearing a loud bang. I ran downstairs, and as I opened the study room door, I saw a vicious sight. Blood was splattered all over the table and wall. Daniel was sitting on his armchair, and his face was gone along with part of his brain. A handgun was loosely hanging from his left hand. The cops were called and the incident was ruled as a suicide. Everyone told me to move out of the house, but I knew I couldn't. On the first night of being alone in this house, I started to experience some weird things. I was cooking in the kitchen when I heard knocks on my door. It was 7.30 in the evening and I wasn't expecting anyone. I walked to the main door and looked through the peephole. There was no one outside. I stared for a while, but saw no one. The empty streets stood still. I turned back to walk away when I heard the knocks again. Thinking some neighborhood kid was pulling a prank, I opened the door and again saw no one. I waited on my porch to notice some suspicious activity, but nothing happened. I locked the door and returned to the kitchen. After dinner, I came to our bedroom, which was my bedroom now. Sleeping on the same bed that I shared with Daniel felt very unsettling to me, but I was really tired. I wanted to cry like every normal wife, but not having any real connection with my husband made crying impossible for me. I can't fake tears. I laid down on the bed and after struggling for half an hour, fell asleep. The house gets too quiet at night. The loudest sound one can hear is the ticking of the clock. I don't remember how long I slept, but suddenly I started to feel chilly. The blanket was below my waist. I pulled it up to my neck. In that drowsy state, I rolled to the other side and someone breathed on my face. It happened so quickly that I just moved my head away without opening my eyes. But within a fraction of a second, I realized there's no one else in this house. I am alone. I woke up with goosebumps. Drops of sweat appeared on my forehead and I took a good look around the room. The moonlight from the window illuminated my view. Realizing I must have scared myself in my sleep, I reached for the glass of water I keep on my nightstand. I must have taken one small sip when I heard footsteps downstairs. My eyes went to the clock, and that's when my stomach dropped in fear. 
It was 3.10 in the morning. I knew very well that all the doors and windows were locked, so there was no chance someone would enter this house without breaking in. I slowly got up from the bed and went downstairs. The study door was closed. With trembling hands, I opened the door. The flashback of that night was going through my head, but this time the study looked completely normal. I stepped in when the light bulb of the room exploded and the study door closed hard behind my back. Feeling horrified, I screamed at the top of my lungs when a black shadow figure appeared in the dark corner of the room. The shadow looked human, but only had eyes. The rest of its body was just pitch black. The pair of bloodshot eyes stared right at me and said in a broken voice, I... I am sorry. Daniel? I is that you? But the voice didn't answer my question, and the light came back immediately. I remembered the light bulb breaking into pieces a few moments back. How was it shining again like nothing happened? Gradually, eerie things started to happen around the house after that day. An invisible presence walked the house 24-7, and I could feel it watching me. One day, I was ironing some old clothes of Daniel's when a pair of cold hands grabbed my shoulder from behind. I almost flinched and screamed in fear. Who? Who is it? Daniel? Uh, are you here? No reply came for a few seconds, but then a loud thud came from the study. I went to the study, grabbing a flashlight this time. As I picked it up, I saw it wasn't a book, rather a diary. As I read the diary, the hair at the back of my neck stood up. It was Daniel's diary. He wrote disturbing things in it. Today, I met Mr. Barbera's daughter, Lucy. The old fool has decided to marry her with me. I didn't plan for this, but now I had no other choice. To inherit his property, I must marry Lucy. But I have already made my second plan. The only obstacle between me and the property is Lucy. I will wait a couple of years and then drop my next and final move. I will make her death look like an accident. But how can she die? How can I make it happen without getting caught? And then, for the next few pages, Daniel had scribbled ideas through which he could make my death appear as an accident. Some of these included slipping down the stairs, catching fire while cooking in the kitchen, etc. My skin crawled, thinking I slept next to a man for two years who was looking for a window of opportunity to kill me and inherit my father's property. I was reading the diary with a panicked face when a gush of wind touched my hair. What the? I turned around and the shadow was back. But this time, the light in the study didn't go out. The shadow with bloodshot eyes kept staring at me like before. I said in a fumbling voice, Daniel, you're supposed to be dead. For the first time, the shadow replied to me. What it said still rings in my ears like an ominous tune. It said, I'm not Daniel. I dropped the diary on the floor and started to run for the main door. The invisible spirit that I mistook for my dead husband was not him, and this was enough for me to leave that house right that moment. I was a few inches away from the main door when two firm hands grabbed my feet and started to pull me back to the study. I screamed and tried to kick, but I was just screaming at the air. There was nothing, but I was being pulled away by these evil hands. Suddenly, I was thrown inside the study, and then I heard a very familiar voice. I am sorry, Lucy. I should have never married you with Daniel. Father? Oh my god! A black swirl of wind started to roll in the middle of the study room and slowly took the form of my father. He stood there with a pale, dead face and uttered for the last and final time, I'm sorry. Forgive me. He disappeared into the air. I'm still living in the same house, and I feel like whatever was stuck here might be gone now. I'm seeing this therapist who thinks my grief-stricken brain resulted in those terrifying hallucinations. I wish I could believe the same and move on with my life, but when I recall how Daniel shot himself in the head with his left hand, my stomach drops. I failed to notice it then, but later I remembered that Daniel was not a left-handed person. His dominant hand was the right one. Do you know why this little detail creeps me out? My father was left-handed. Is it possible he rose from the dead and possessed Daniel to take his life before he could take mine? Is it possible? Or am I just going mad, alone in this house? It was a winter evening and I got off from work late. 
Generally, I take my car, but that particular day, everything was against me. Before leaving for work, I got a flat tire, so I took the bus. The entire day was full of pressure, so I forgot to tell my roommate to pick me up that night. I live in a not-so-ideal neighborhood, so whenever I work late night, my roommate Kayla comes to pick me up. She's a freelance graphic designer, so never hesitates to help me in an emergency. FYI, I do the same for her, too. When I came out of the office, the roads were starting to get empty, and I realized I wouldn't be getting any taxis now, so my only way out was Uber. I sat down at the bus stop waiting for my car to arrive. The driver's name was Maurice, and he had a 4.8 star rating, which felt pretty assuring at that moment. The weather was getting extremely cold, and all I wanted was to go home and have hot chocolate sitting near the fireplace. Kayla called me and asked when I would reach home. She wanted to come and pick me up, but it would have taken an hour, so I told her not to bother. Even though there was nothing to worry about, she told me to share the ride with her just in case. After waiting for five minutes, I saw bright headlights coming in my direction. I am a safety girl, so before getting into the car, I checked the number plate and made sure it was my ride. After getting into the car, I shared my location with Kayla and the driver started the engine. Honestly, the man Maurice was a well-behaved and very quiet guy, which I liked. He was driving safely, which calmed me down. I thought, at least I'll get home safe. Only if I knew my fate was laughing at me. After driving for 15 minutes straight, we came onto a dusty road. The neighborhood I live in is located on the outskirts, which is why I always prefer taking my car wherever I go. There were grass fields on both sides of the road. I asked Maurice if I could light a cigarette, and he politely agreed. I rolled down my window and clicked the lighter when a spine-chilling scream stopped my heartbeat. Maurice yelled in a terrifying voice. What was that? I... I don't know. Both of us were white like a sheet. Maurice pressed hard on the accelerator, and creating a squeaky sound, the car took up speed. We might have gone a few meters when the scream took place again, followed by a woman's voice. Help! Please help me! Maurice still didn't stop, but I said, We have to stop! Didn't you hear? She needs help! No, ma'am. We shouldn't be stopping here. I have a bad feeling about all this. What are you saying? A woman is in trouble. No, ma'am. I'm not stopping here. Before we could argue more about this, the Uber started to make pretty weird noises, and after shaking two or three times, the engine stopped. Now I started to feel bad about this entire situation. I don't know why, something at the back of my head kept telling me Maurice was right. We were so shocked by everything going on at that moment that neither of us got out of the car for a while. Maurice tried to start the engine once again, but there was no luck. I told you there was something bad here. Sit here. I'll check the engine. With trembling hands, Maurice opened the car door and got out. I saw him grabbing the cross he was wearing around his neck and muttering prayers. We were both scared, but it seemed like Maurice was suspecting there was something paranormal involved in this matter. I, on the other hand, was freaking out thinking there is indeed a woman inside those grass fields who needs our help. But Maurice's behavior was scaring me too, so I decided it would be better if I just call the cops. As I took out my phone to dial 911, I saw there was no signal. I was going to tell Maurice to do the same when I heard a rustling sound in those grass fields. I followed the sound, and the vast grass field just stood in front of my eyes right under the night sky. There was no one, just the unending horizon. The sounds of crickets, followed by howling wind, spooked me a bit. Suddenly, a chunk of grass started rustling like crazy, and soon I could see something rushing at the car. Whatever was hiding in that grass field was running at us at full speed, and I screamed, Maurice, get in the car! He turned in the same direction as that running sound, but before he could take a single step, something came out from that bushy field and lunged on Maurice, making him scream for his life, and then everything went quiet. The car bonnet was obstructing my view, but I was sure whatever jumped on Maurice was now sitting in front of the car. After a moment of silence, I heard bones snapping. There was also another sound that seemed like flesh tearing. Paralyzed with fear, I slowly came out of the car and tried to peek. I thought it must be a wild animal, but what I saw scarred me for life. A woman with long black hair was sitting over Maurice and digging up his entrails from his cut open stomach. His eyes were bulging out in fear, which tells me he died a painful death. A gasp of breath came out of me as I choked in fear and the woman turned her face toward me. I have never seen such a horrifying face. 
There was no skin, making the flesh underneath poke out like a nightmare. Her eyes were bloodshot like a demon from hell. The woman chuckled at me and stood up. I wanted to run away, but my legs didn't move a bit. Suddenly, she chuckled like a possessed person and said, Help me! <laughs> she ran into the grass at full speed. I fainted on the ground after witnessing such a grotesque scene. Seeing me not return home and my live location stuck near the grass field area, Kayla called 911 and came for my rescue. The cops found me unconscious and Maurice dead. But the story doesn't end here. The next day, when I woke up in the hospital and told the cops about this woman, they all kept staring at me in disbelief. Without wondering about who that woman could be, the cops gave me bizarre news that swept the ground beneath my feet. After rescuing me and taking Maurice's body from the scene, they were going through the car and found something unthinkable in his trunk. There was a dead body of a woman in the trunk of his Uber. She had long black hair and her face was cut off. They searched his house and found out this woman was his wife, whom he murdered before coming to pick me up. Not knowing what to do, he carried the body with him, thinking he would dump it on the way. The cops ruled this case out as an attack made by some wild animal, but I know what I saw that night. Now, when I think about this, I feel like the reason Maurice didn't want to follow that woman's voice was that he recognized it in the first place. He knew it was his dead wife screaming for help, and that's why he started praying to God, expecting something paranormal to take place. People who believe in spirits say that those who die with unfulfilled wishes often come back. So was it Maurice's dead wife who came back for revenge? Or was it something else that still lurks in that bushy grass field? My girlfriend is a fighter, and I can't be prouder of her. Lily and I met in a pub one night. She is of average height and pretty. Any guy would be lucky to call her his girlfriend. I went up to her and offered to buy a drink. What felt weird was the way she was all alone, sitting in the darkest corner of the pub, looking at the people around her with wide, confused eyes. At first, I thought she is an introvert who decided to hit the pub to socialize one sudden day. But the more I talked to her, I realized she is hiding the secret. She got wasted that night, and as we were dancing, she hugged me and said, Don't let me go. I'm very lonely. Being a foster kid my whole life, her words made my heart ache. I know how it feels to be all alone in this cruel world because I wake up and go to bed with the same feeling every day. I had no idea where she lived and leaving her in that pub being all drunk didn't seem the right thing to me. So I brought her to my place. Since then, she is staying with me. I didn't mind because I earn well enough to take care of both of us and I like being around her. Soon, she became my family. One day, when I came home to get something in the afternoon, I found the main door wide open. I thought Lily left, but as I entered my bedroom, I discovered her dark secret. She was lying on the floor, unconscious, heavily dosed with drugs. Yes, my girlfriend had a drug problem, but unlike other guys, I didn't judge her or try to get rid of her. Loneliness can make people do terrible things whereas Lily can still be saved. I took her to the nearest hospital and got her the medical help she needed. After two days, she got discharged and came home. I sat her down to finally address the elephant in the room. Lily, how are you feeling? Why did you save me? Because I love you. No one loves a wreck. I do. I'm a wreck myself. Trust me, we are perfect for each other. Just let me help you. How? I have an idea that will help you get past this drug problem. What is that? You just have to channel your addiction to something else. Like food. Food? Yeah. You can even have your own YouTube channel. These eating videos, or rather known as mukbang, bring popularity overnight. Think about it. You'll be eating your favorite dishes and also earn money. We will be so happy together. Please, let's give it a try. Lily looked at me with a confused face. Like she had no faith in my brilliant idea. But I was confident. I knew this will work well for both of us. I can't let her ruin her life. The only way she will be alive is not to be alone ever again. After a lot of discussions, she finally agreed to try this. I went to the supermarket 
and bought all the ingredients to make us some delicious beef steak. She sat down in front of our dining table and we rehearsed some lines for her intro. I prepared a juicy steak with all my special ingredients and placed it in front of her. She smiled at me and I said, let's do this, action. Hi everyone, I'm Lily and this is my first mukbang video. Today I'll be eating beef steak made by a special friend of mine, so let's start. She cut a big piece with a knife and put it in her mouth with a fork. As her tongue touched the juicy meat, I saw her eyes sparkle. For the last two days, she couldn't eat properly at the hospital, so this steak was like a treasure to her. She started gobbling it piece after piece like she can't get enough. Within 10 minutes, she finished the entire steak and sipped the lemonade with comfort on her face. I was so happy seeing her contained like this. We uploaded the video and her journey as a YouTube personality started. She slept for an entire day after having a complete meal. When she woke up the next morning, she looked so radiant and glowing. I walked to her bed and kissed her on the cheek. Good morning. Someone had a long needed nap. What? What happened last night? You uploaded your first mukbang video. Don't you remember? Oh, yeah. It feels like I woke up after a year. My head feels so heavy. Well, that will be around for a while, but I will help you get over your withdrawals. I'm not going to leave you alone for a second, Lily. Now, I record every single meal of her. Though, after a meal, she almost sleeps for an entire day. This is, in a way, good, because she doesn't have to go through her withdrawals. She never talks about taking drugs, ever. And I just love the way she eats after waking up from a deep sleep. I tie a napkin around her neck as she keeps dropping food on her clothes like a child. She is so adorable. I just can't get enough of her. No matter how worked up I get, I always cook for her. There's no way I'm letting her eat takeaway foods because they won't have my special ingredients. Apart from all the spices, I put another ingredient in her food. A small amount of morphine. Yes, yes, I know it's not necessary, but it helps her to fall asleep easily. Also, it makes her forget to leave my house. I don't like it when sometimes she talks about leaving me. She has no idea what this world will do to her if I am not in her life. I mix a little amount of morphine in her drinks. After sleeping and not eating for an entire day, when I serve her the food, she forgets everything and jumps onto her plate. She gobbles them with wide eyes, and that gives me so much peace. Sometimes, I create a small gap in her diet by not giving her the morphine. I don't want her to lose her memory completely. I have been to a house, which was in a dingy alley. I got all her belongings here and also did some research on her background. Like me, she has no one as well. I knew we would be perfect for each other. Tonight... I am going to bake her a wedding cake. She will be surprised knowing we are getting married tonight. But I don't want to disrupt her routine. So the entire ceremony will happen after she eats. I will carry her in my arms while she is highly intoxicated with the morphine and dance with her. She is the perfect life partner. No complaint, no demands, and yet so calm. She seems even more beautiful when she sleeps. I kiss her, play with her hair, and she never says no. She just lies down next to me, keeping her eyes closed, looking like a peaceful dream. I feel so lucky that she met me at the pub and no one else. I will do exactly what she asked me to do. I'll never let her go. Just think about it, how happy we will be. None of us will ever be lonely. As I said, loneliness can make people do terrible things. <laughs> Hi, I am Max, and you can call me an extrovert. I love getting out and meeting new people. I'm an avid user of all the social media platforms as they offer unlimited access to meeting strangers. Some might find this weird, but I can't go on without socializing, be it offline or online. 
So when my friend Daniel told me about this site, Omegle, I couldn't stop myself from checking it out. I was able to connect with people around the world and listen to their stories and share mine. The only thing I failed to anticipate is that the world is way more complicated than that. It was a rainy Thursday afternoon. I was playing Grand Theft Auto V on my PS5. My roommate Nash wasn't home that day, so it was just me in the two-story house amidst a thunderstorm. I yawned big while getting extremely bored and quit the game. Thinking about what I should be doing next, I opted for Omegle to chat with a bunch of strangers. FYI, I already used the site several times before that day, so I was perfectly okay with doing it again. I have done video calling at Omegle before, so I connected to the chat room without much ado. As the site took time to connect me to a stranger, I went to the kitchen to grab something to eat. I came back with a bowl of nachos and a Coke. My eyes didn't go to the screen immediately as I was busy sorting my desk. All this time, I didn't notice that the chat had been connected and the stranger on the other side was just watching me doing all these things, quietly. When I sat down on my chair and glanced at my computer screen for the first time, I almost got a heart attack. Two big bulky eyes were stuck to the webcam in a very freaky way. Whoever was on the other side came extremely close to the camera on purpose. Whoa, what the hell? <laughs> Hi. The eyes went back and I saw a weird looking man sitting in a blue room. The blue light of that room was so unsettling that one could get a headache just by looking at it. The man kept staring at me, probably waiting for me to answer him back but I didn't know what to say for a while. Realizing I am making things even more awkward, I promptly replied, Hi, uh, hi, how are you? It was fun to watch you come in and arrange your desk without you knowing I was watching you. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't notice the screen at first. So what's your name? Um, my name is Max. And you are? I am Anthony. So, where are you from, Anthony? Jacksonville. I was expecting he would ask me the same thing, but he stopped talking and looked behind him. Right at that moment, I heard a muffled sound inside his room. I can't exactly explain the nature of that sound, but it was similar to a low whining. What was that? Nothing, just my pet Lucy. Oh, I see. Uh, don't mind me asking, but uh, why is your room so blue? <laughs> These lights calm me down. I recently had a bad breakup, so I, I haven't been feeling myself lately. That's sad to hear. Uh, what happened? Well, we were living together for a while, but one morning she just decided to leave me and go back to her ex. Girls are mean, I tell you. I don't think all of them are. Also, you'll get over it. Don't be so- Get over it? Get over it? You can't just get over someone you love with your everything? She is my soulmate! We are supposed to be together. I didn't expect a sudden outburst. Hence, I wasn't ready to react to it either. I just paused, feeling highly embarrassed, and then decided to apologize for making such a sly comment on his matter. I I'm sorry. I, I had no idea. I hope you can forgive me. You're a sweet little boy. Of course. I'll forgive you. Do you have a girlfriend? Well, not yet. I have a crush on the girl in class, but I haven't told her yet. I'm not even sure if she likes me or not. Well, I can give you some tips to win her heart. Um, really? What should I do then? Follow her wherever she goes. Don't let any other guy come near her. When a guy tried to talk to my girlfriend, I pushed him down the stairs and sent him to the hospital. Problem solved. <laughs> what? Relax, I'm joking. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> the more I talked to this guy, the more I realized how paranoid he is. He was giving me tips on how to stalk my crush and forcefully proclaim my love for her. I soon realized this dude is a pure nut job. He was just being so creepy that after a point, it started to freak me out. He barely blinked. And every so often, I could hear that muffled whining in his room. Hey, are you even listening to me? Yeah, I, I was just thinking, it's late. Probably I should go offline now. Why? We're having such a good time. 
Two bros chilling and sharing their girl problems. No, man, I, I better go. It was nice meeting you. Don't you disconnect. I'm sorry, what? Don't you dare walk out on me. Do you know what I do to those who walk out on me? Saying this, he got up from his computer and went to the corner of the room. He switched on the room light and I noticed his bed. Something was lying on it, covered with a blanket. Are you ready for the surprise, Max? Here it comes! Saying this, he pulled the blanket in one go, and what I saw made my stomach drop. A girl was lying on the bed. Her hands and legs were tied along with her mouth. On top of her lay a dead body that was rotting vigorously. Its flesh was melting and falling off her body. Maggots was slowly crawling from that dead body to her face. It was the most disgusting sight one could witness. She whimpered <laughs> while bursting into silent tears, and I finally understood the reality behind Anthony's pet, Lucy. The girl was facing the webcam, and I could see her looking at me with anxious eyes, asking for help. But there's no way I could have helped her at that moment. Lucy left me for her ex, even though I loved her with all I had. So now... She is stuck with her ex forever. <laughs> they are inseparable now. And I'm going to watch the maggots slowly eat her alive. <laughs> You're a sick psycho. I'm calling the cops right now. I'll make sure you rot in jail, you freak. <laughs> you can try. Hope the cops find me. Goodbye, Max. Don't you disconnect. Wait, wait. Have a good night's sleep! <laughs> no! Wait! The chat got disconnected, and I sat there, speechless, clueless, like a statue. When I finally got my shit together, I called my roommate and told him everything. The next day, we went to the cops and filed a complaint about this guy. But finding one crazy psycho among a sea of humans through Omegle is next to impossible. The cops contacted the police in Jacksonville, but... I bet it wasn't his real name. I have no idea if that girl is still alive. Because if she is, Anthony is probably watching her getting eaten by maggots alive. It was a cold August morning. It was a typical Thursday workday that for anyone would go unnoticed. But in Mike's case, it was a special day. The young man had just broken off a relationship of more than 10 years and was just recovering from that experience. He was advised to go out, meet new people, or enjoy the nightlife. But he had another plan in mind. The young man had asked for two days off from work and talked to his uncle to borrow his house in the mountains, a spiritual retreat where he has no signal, no internet, and his cell phone would remain off. There are no neighbors around to bother him and his ex would not be able to contact him either. Before he left, his ex-girlfriend's van was waiting for him outside. Are you sure about this? Of course. Amanda, I know it's something that'll do me good. Having a whim and hiding in the mountains is not my idea of something that can do any good. It makes sense, but it'll work for me. Don't come crying to my house if you're being chased by a yeti. Your uncle is capable of hiding them in the closet. <laughs> With any luck, I won't even meet my own shadow. It's just a few days, and I'll see you and talk things over, okay? Okay. Mike traveled for more than five hours, and when he arrived, everything was as he expected. Despite being small, the house was nicely decorated, and the furniture was kept in perfect condition. To his disappointment, the phone still had a signal, and he immediately received a call from his uncle as soon as he arrived. Hey, uncle. Good morning, Mike. Are you home yet? just got here and I was able to get in. Do you have cameras? You just called me as I walked in. That would be a very good investment, but unfortunately not. Tell me, why don't I hear your friends? You went with them, didn't you? Yeah, well, we're all here. I had to move away so they wouldn't uh, start making jokes while I was talking. Oh, well, great. Take care of the house and remember to call me if you have any problems. Great, thanks a lot. The young man remembered how he had to lie to his uncle saying that he wouldn't enter the house unless he went with his friends. His uncle was one of those conspiranoid people 
and went on and on about how he didn't want to go into that house for fear of finding aliens, so Mike usually ignored him. With a small, complicit chuckle, he thought of how little use the house would have been if he had to share it with someone else. After a full day of relaxation and tranquility, Mike went to sleep with immeasurable peace, but it didn't last long. A strange noise made him open his eyes. The room was dark, and the moonlight was barely coming through the window. Mike thought it was probably raining, so he tried to relax again. Before he could fall asleep, a beam of light hit his eyes and alerted him. Opening them, he realized it was the moonlight shining directly against the window. Mike tried to continue sleeping, but paranoia overcame him, and he could not convince himself that it was all a dream. So the young man got dressed and slowly got out of bed. He looked out the window and saw no one. After returning to bed, the young man was about to cover himself, but an image froze him with fear. As he made his discovery, the blood in his body froze, and fear came over him so suddenly that every fiber of his body translated into pain. The window a few feet away was closed, but there was a dirt trail that started at the window and ended under his bed. The only thing Mike could think of was to take a big leap from the bed and start running, maybe grab a knife and hide, or maybe drift away until daylight. But suddenly, he was falling and hitting his head against the wall. Whoever was under his bed lifted it to one side, causing Mike to fall. Immediately, something jumped out of the mess of sheets and rushed at Mike's body. By the time Mike could react and understand what was happening, a tall, white, gangly man stood above him with a knife in his hand. His blue eyes were wide open, staring with unwarranted anger into Mike's eyes. Despite being very skinny, this man had a lot of strength and knew some martial art, since his whole body was arranged in such a way that the young man could not move a muscle. Please, don't, don't kill me. I closed my eyes. I didn't get to see your face. Mike cried desperately with tears in his eyes, without moving a muscle. Just, just take everything. I'm not going to move from here. Tie me up if you want. So you didn't see my face, and you promised not to move, kid? I swear, I'm not interested in justice. If you don't believe me, I don't have a landline here. Take my cell phone and my car. What a kind and cooperative boy. Tell me, kid, where are the valuables? Move the dining room furniture. You'll, you'll see a hole. I have money stored in case... Without letting him finish his sentence, the psychopath began to cut Mike's forehead with his knife, tracing a horizontal line. Sorry to interrupt you, kid, but you were boring me. I was telling you where you could find my money. You see, I have no intention of robbing you. The only reason I have to visit you is to see you bleeding. Wh why? Because I saw you while you were pumping gas on the way here. And to be honest, you have a face of a squealing pig, and I love it. With that said, the imposter slowly plunged the knife into Mike's hand, making sure to twist the knife into his skin. Meanwhile, Mike was still not opening his eyes. Fear had taken over his whole body, which remained motionless next to a person who had the intention of taking his life. He thought of his family, his friends, even his ex. Suddenly, the psychopath released the knife and began to beat the boy savagely while he could only cry and beg for mercy. In a moment of clarity, Mike opened his eyes and noticed how the criminal had his eyes closed and pointed upwards, as if enjoying the moment. The boy used all his strength to push him down. Mike stood up and ran desperately, but he was bouncing around trying not to fall. He had lost a lot of blood and received many blows, so he was very dizzy. At the moment, Mike felt he had the man behind him, about to catch him, but when he turned around, he was still on the ground, laughing, as if enjoying the show. Without grabbing his car, Mike just ran as far away from the house as he could, hoping to run into someone to help him. As he was escaping, he could hear the man's taunting cries from the cabin. Run, little piggy! Fly to your freedom. Don't stumble, or you might hit your head. And who knows what the evil killer will do to you. 
I'll be waiting for you. When you want to come back, I'll always be at home. When he returned the next day with the police, no one was there. The criminal, a known patient from a nearby insane asylum, had even gone to the trouble of cleaning the house. Mike had no intention of staying or returning to it. From that day on, every time his uncle mentions an alien, he laughs generously and thinks that having an encounter with a human could be much worse. It's been 20 years, yet the memory of this incident feels so fresh. I was eight years old back then. I lived with my dad as my parents were going through a divorce. My dad worked as a nurse at the local hospital, so he had to pull a lot of night shifts often. Whenever he had night shifts, I went to spend the night with my grandma, who lived two blocks away from our house. But the night when this incident happened, my grandma was out of town. It was a Saturday night, and my dad and I were all set to go out to dinner when his phone rang. After talking for a brief moment, my dad told me he has to rush to the hospital as it's an emergency, but he'll be back in an hour. He asked me if I would be okay to stay on my own for a while, which I gladly accepted. Being an eight-year-old, having the house to yourself felt quite thrilling. He got into his car and he told me to lock the doors and watch TV until he comes back. I watched him drive away and then lock the door. It was my first time being home alone, so I felt like a king. I could do whatever I want now, and there's no one to scold me. I drank a lot of juice, ate three scoops of ice cream, two big chocolate muffins, without having to ask for permission. I then ran into my dad's office, which always fascinated me. I sat on his big armchair and started to go through the stuff lying on his table. He had a fountain pen that often grabbed my attention. I started writing with it, on his fresh white memo pads. After jeopardizing a few pages of the memo pad, I rolled them into a paper ball and aimed for the basket in the corner. Fifteen minutes went by doing all these stupid things when I remembered about the clown head. A patient of my dad gave him a big rubber clown head before passing away in a terrible accident. My dad couldn't say no to the man, so he brought it home. But he kept it in the garage, and no matter how many times I asked for it, he never let me play with that. I've always been a weird kid who was never terrified of clowns. Instead, I liked them. I love their goofy appearance. I came out of his office and walked to the garage. The house was so quiet that I could hear my every footstep creaking on the wooden floor. I entered the garage and turned on the lights. The clown head was about a foot tall, with no holes for eyes or nostrils. The clown face was drawn on. It can be creepy to some people, but not to me. As I already said, I had a fascination for clowns. I picked up the clown head, and suddenly, a stroke of cold wind brushed through my left shoulder. Holding the clown head, I turned back and saw nothing in that empty garage. The eyes of the clown were blue, and his smile was too big to describe. As I hold the clown head in my hands, a weird sensation took over my body. I began to hear a voice in my head. The voice was hush, yet shrill. Put it on. What? Is anyone here? Shh. Just put it on. Before I could realize I was talking to myself, my hands lifted my head and made me wear it. I can't explain the feeling when my head entered the clown head, but I still feel something hypnotized me. Something made me wear it, using my own hands. I stood like a statue for a moment. The clown head was weird from the inside. A smell of rubber mixed with paint lingered inside of the air of the clown head. As I snapped out of my state of trance, I realized I didn't want to play with it anymore, hence decided to take it off. and. That's when the nightmare began. I casually pulled the clown head, but it didn't come out. Thinking it might have got stuck, I grabbed the top of the head with both my hands and pulled it again, but the head didn't move an inch. Drops of sweat appeared on my forehead as I realized the air inside the head had started to warm up, and there is no hole for ventilation in it. I couldn't see or hear anything, and my breathing got heavy. Okay, okay, it'll come off. I just have to pull harder. I told myself to keep calm and not panic. I started pulling the head, but it wasn't coming off. 
I tried to slip my finger in to create a gap, but it was stuck around my neck too tightly. What the hell? I tried harder for a few more seconds and finally started to panic. The air inside the head was getting hotter with me panicking and I started choking and gasping inside it. It was so damn easy to put on, but feels completely impossible to take off. Tears rolled down my cheek in fear. I screamed, Dad, help me! But then remembered I am the only one in this house. I couldn't make my way outside the garage and it also didn't feel safe to walk with this head on. I feared if I stumble down, then I'll get more injured. Slowly, I started to suffocate. I grabbed it, pulled it, hit it with my small hands, but nothing helped. I screamed and felt even more terrified, hearing them cough inside the clown head. There's no way my neighbors can hear me, which means if I don't take it out myself, I'll die. My ears turn red, and I can feel my entire face burning. The situation was so claustrophobic that I peed my pants. I was suffering and crying. I prayed to God to get me out of this and I will never look at it again. My paranoia reached such a level that I felt pressure in my neck and vomited at once. The juice, muffins, ice cream all came out from my mouth in the worst form possible and started to float inside the clown head which was also running out of breathable air. The toxic smell of my vomit mixed with the rubbery smell of the clown head made me realize death is not far away. As I moved left to right in panic, the vomit moved around my nose and ear, which resulted in me vomiting more and more. I couldn't stop myself, even if I wanted to. Now, I was choking in my vomit under the worst circumstances possible. My nostrils got blocked by the disgusting fluid and my ears felt numb. A shrill beep was going in my head that started to blur my vision. I understood if I don't do something quickly, I am not going to survive. I pulled and pulled, but the head was getting tighter around my neck. I was trying hard, but suddenly my hand slipped and I fell on the shelves at the garage wall. Trying to regain my balance, I fell on the floor at my back and the vomited fluid went behind my head and let my nose finally pop out. I was searching for something when my hand picked up a metal tool that had fallen from the shelf. It was a spanner. I placed the pointy arc between my jaw and the clown head and started to put pressure on the head to come out. The spanner created a small gap and the gooey fluid started to drip from the gap. I kept still until most of the fluid flowed away and some amount of air flowed in, giving me a chance to fight back. Once I regained my sanity, I grabbed the spanner real tight and said to myself that in the count of three, I'll put all my pressure so that the spanner pulls up the clown head. One, two, Three. As I did what I planned, a cracking sound took place with horrifying pain that made me scream. The clown head tore from that one corner due to the pressure, but my jaw broke as well. Smeared in blood, vomit, and sweat, when I finally took the clown head off, I heard footsteps coming at me while screaming my name. Andrew! Andrew! Oh my god! Andrew! I woke up in the hospital two days later. Doctors had to clip my left jaw back, followed by seven hours of surgery. There was nothing to do, no one to blame, as it was an accident that happened to a stupid kid who did a stupid thing while being home alone. Luckily, my broken jaw got better with time, and I don't have difficulty talking or eating, as steel plates are attached inside my mouth to support my facial structure. The only thing that bothers me is my scar. I have this huge scar on my left cheek. It forms into a disturbing smile whenever I stretch my lips. I've lost my face forever. Now, there's an invisible clown head resting on me for the rest of my life. It was busy Monday morning. The first day of the week and I was running late. I work in an IT company where my job is to handle PR campaigns. In one word, I hate my job, but it pays well, so I'm going on with it anyway. I took an Uber to reach the office quicker. After dodging the busy traffic, when the Uber pulled in front of the huge building gate, all I could see were cops and paramedics. The red-blue light flashed the area like crazy, and the coarse sirens of cop cars were enough to deafen me. I checked the address to ensure the Uber had come to the right location, and to my surprise, it did. I got out of the car and walked up to the gate when a middle-aged cop rushed at me saying, 
Sir, you can't go in. What do you mean I can't go in? I work here. What's going on? Look, there has been an accident. We can't let anybody go in until we recover the body. What? What body? Sir, please wait here. The cop didn't answer me and went towards a group of cops who were standing, circling a stretcher at some distance. Being completely clueless, I called my assistant, Martha. She told me there had been a horrible accident. A woman jumped from the office roof, and while falling down, her toe got stuck in the fire exit stairs. Her head bashed into the iron stairs, and she hung like a slaughtered pig until the janitor found blood on the ground. He looked up, and there she was, hanging upside down from the 18th floor window. I stood there, stunned, and watched the paramedics take out a bloody dead body towards the ambulance, parked outside. I couldn't see the body, but I bet the poor woman bled a lot. The white sheet over the body was soaked in blood stains from the other side. Finally, when I got the chance to go in, a horrifying realization daunted me. Did Martha say 18th floor? I immediately got into the elevator, and when it reached my office floor, I ran to my cabin. All the employees were standing in front of my cabin. As they saw me, their faces turned white. What the hell is going on here? My boss came straight to me and grabbed my arm, saying, Ryan, you don't want to go in there. What? Why not? I didn't listen and pushed him aside to see why everyone was standing outside my cabin with a freaked out face. As I walked in, I discovered the reason right away. My office is on the 18th floor and I always felt a bit weird knowing that the fire exit is right next to my cabin window. I remember how my colleagues often joked that I would be the first survivor if the floor caught fire. The window of my cabin is now shattered. Broken glass was everywhere. A piece of torn bloody cloth was hanging from one corner of the window. Um, when she jumped, her toe got stuck here, and the wind kind of bashed her onto the window. The cops had to take her body from this window. Oh my god! You should take a day off. Also, it will take time to clean this place, and I'll be fine. Did anyone find out anything about this woman? Not yet. No one from this building knows her. Seems like she just went to the roof and jumped. Two police officers came and took all the evidence they could. Once the cops were gone, the office started to fall back into place. This is New York and time is money here. Many employees came to me and said pretty much the same thing. Everyone kept talking about this death the entire day. I mean, the incident was unsettling, but life goes on, whether we are ready or not. I tried not to think about it, and once the work pressure kicked in, I forgot about it. It was about 7 p.m., and everyone was getting off. Due to the messed up situation in the morning, I could hardly work. So when my boss told me to go home, I decided to stay back and finish them. Some called me brave, and some called me stupid for working a night shift, but I ignored it. Slowly, the office space became emptier and quieter. One by one, all the employees went home. I was sitting at a small table near a window. The long corridor leading to my cabin stood on my left. I have been here night after night, but for the first time, the silence of this place felt eerie. I got up and went to my cabin. The wind was howling in from the broken window. I stood in front of it and lit up a cigarette. I looked down and saw something was stuck in the metallic base of the fire exit. I flashed my phone torch on it and a cold feeling rushed down my spine. A broken toenail was still stuck there. Chunks of flesh were attached to it. I could still see the shiny red nail polish painted on it. You shouldn't be so close to the window. I turned back hearing this sudden advice and saw a woman in her late thirties standing outside my cabin. I couldn't see her face as she was keeping her head down. She was wearing a white shirt with a black pencil skirt like every other working woman. Sorry, do you work here? I used to, before your boss fired me. Oh, I haven't seen you before. I'm Jolene. You weren't here when it happened. Why didn't you go home? I just had a couple of things pending from work. But wait a minute. If you were fired, then how did you get inside? The door doesn't open without our employee ID swipe. Well, I kept mine in case I needed to come back. This woman seemed pretty weird to me. 
Her voice was expressionless, and she kept her head down. She turned around and started walking down the corridor. I came in having lots of questions and concerns when I noticed she was limping in a very odd way. Are you all right? I asked her while walking behind her. She turned her partial face at me and smiled creepily. Excuse me, but what are you doing here at this hour? The boss isn't here. You might want to take that call. What call? Suddenly, my phone rang out loud, shocking the hell out of me. I took it out of my pocket and saw it was Martha, my assistant. Hey, what is it? Ryan, I have shocking news. The cops took our boss into custody. It seems like the woman who committed suicide today used to work at our office a few years back. He fired her after his wife found out about their affair. Everyone is saying they still went on with it secretly until Mr. Smith broke it off with her two days back. I always knew this wasn't a good human being. What? Did the cops find out her name? Yeah, they said her name was Jolene, but... My phone fell from my hand. Martha kept talking from the other side, but I couldn't understand a single word. My eyes were stuck to the ground. The woman that I was following for a while is now standing barefooted, and I couldn't help but notice how shiny and red the toenail paint that was decorating her feet was. Except for one big toe. It had no nail, and the flesh was cut off, making it bleed. I slowly looked up, and for the first time, I saw her face. It wasn't human. Her nose was broken, and one eye was filled with blood. The other eye was bulging out of her eye socket, like she got hit by something hard on the face. I couldn't scream even if I wanted to. She then smiled at me most disturbingly and ran towards the window at the end of the corridor at full speed. Shattering the thick glass, her mutilated body fell from the 18th floor once again, but this time I heard her dying scream. I might have passed out in fear, and when I came back to my senses, I found myself lying on the empty office floor. The window through which I saw her jump out of was absolutely fine. It was as if nothing happened, and all of this was just a nightmare. I can't explain how I drove back home after that, but I don't think I will ever be able to stay that late at night at my office again. I have a feeling that she will keep coming back until it's all over. This is the shocking story of a girl named Grace Mullane, who disappeared on the day before her birthday. Grace was from Wickford, Essex. After graduating from the University of Lincoln with a bachelor's degree in advertising and marketing, she set out on a backpacking tour. It was her long-needed break, so she planned to make the most of it. She went to stay in New Zealand for two weeks after spending six weeks in South America. Excited about turning 22, Grace was on cloud nine. She traveled around the Upper North Island and then arrived in Auckland on 30th November. Being on her solo trip and having adventures in mind, she decided to go out and explore the place in her way. She was having a time of her life until she met a guy on Tinder named Jesse Shane Kimpson. They both matched and started to talk. Kimpson asked her out quite immediately and Grace was stunned to see how persuasive he was. The 27-year-old sent the first message on the dating app saying, Hey Grace, how are you? Much planned for the weekend? She responded after a couple of minutes. Hey, I'm good, thanks. And it's my birthday tomorrow, but I have no plans. Keen to know what Grace was up to in the evening, he replied, Oh shit, happy birthday for tomorrow. Much planned for this evening then? Haha, <laughs> thank you, I haven't. Kimpson then asked the backpacker if she wants a drink, and she replied, mm, Yeah, maybe. Maybe yes? Convince me. Seeing this, Kimpson gave her a pretty weird reply saying, <laughs> Well, my shout. <laughs> Grace didn't understand and asks what he is trying to say. Kimpson then clarifies that he would like to pay for the drinks, that signifying the outing will be his treat. Grace then asked Kimpson where they would go, and he says he knows a cool Mexican place up near Sky City that does great cocktails. Not being a fan of Mexican food, Grace replied, Okay, no to Mexican, but maybe to the cocktails. Just a minute later, Kimpson started to appear very pushy. He said, Okay, there's a few places up there that do great cocktails. How about we meet at Sky City? Getting startled with this persuasive behavior, 
Grace politely asked. But I haven't said yes yet. Kimson still kept pushing her for meeting up, saying, You haven't said either. So what's it going to take to make this happen then? Realizing his pushover nature might screw up the date, he promptly added how nice it would be to spend some time on the night before her birthday. She then told him she only brought casual clothes with her, to which he said, is fine. At almost 3 a.m., Grace finally agreed to the plan of meeting Kimson and asked him to add her on Facebook. Kimson got what he wanted, and Grace didn't realize what horrible nightmare was waiting for her on the night before her birthday. She had no idea that eight months before, Kimson had brutally raped another British tourist. In this CCTV camera footage, Kimson can be seen waiting for Grace. Grace finally met him, and then they went to the mall, to a pub, and the last few seconds of this footage, they were seen getting into his hostel to go to his room. Grace and Kimson got into the elevator, and that was the last time Grace was seen alive. What happened next can only be described as grotesque, shocking, and terrifying. Malane's parents became concerned after she did not reply to the birthday wishes they sent on the 2nd December 2018. Grace, far from home, about to celebrate her 22nd birthday, had willingly gone to his hostel room. Until she entered the lift to his apartment, she appeared to have been enjoying her night. Hours earlier, she had messaged her friend during a Tinder date with the killer, telling her it would be the last communication she would have with the friends and family she had left behind in Britain, those who loved her so much. It was this one act that led police right to him. Soon after 9.30 p.m., the footage shows them leaving and heading to the lobby of the City Life Hotel, where they enter the lift, the killer fumbling for his key card as they head towards room 308. What exactly happened in that room was not hard to guess after that. Being a psychopath and deranged-minded person, Kimson assaulted her and then strangled her to death. He also took seven intimate photographs of Grace's dead body, including close-ups manipulating the body to get the shots he wanted. The following morning, with Grace still lying dead in room 308, he texted another woman he had met on Tinder, trying to arrange a date for later that day. Shortly after, he was again caught on CCTV buying a suitcase. And this is where the murder takes an even shocking turn. Kipson bought a suitcase and put the victim's body inside to get rid of it later. The footage that was found from the CCTV camera is enough to make your skin crawl. Kimson is seen carrying it casually. People around him had no idea that inside that suitcase lies the dead body of a sweet, innocent girl who was murdered on the night before her birthday. Footage shows him going from his room to a leisure store to buy an identical suitcase, then to a supermarket to buy some cleaning products, and then to a car hire firm. He rented a red Toyota hatchback car and, as Grace lay dead in his hotel room, headed out in the afternoon to meet up with the other woman he had been texting earlier in the day at a bar in the trendy Auckland suburb of Ponsonby. In the meantime, the police acquired all the CCTV footage and understood he is the one behind Grace's disappearance. Even though he lied at first to the police, but by the time of his second interview, he had no choice but to admit to killing Grace. He said that he choked her and had no remorse for the devilish acts he did to this poor girl. The jury found him guilty. During his trial, he was described as a sociopath who made some of the women he met or communicated with on Tinder highly uncomfortable. It later emerged that he took another British tourist out on a Tinder date before bringing her back to his Auckland motel room eight months before he killed Grace. Kimson raped the tourist, then 21, while she lay on the bed crying and frozen with fear after she refused to have intercourse with him. She kept the attack secret until she recognized Kempson from the media coverage the day he was charged with Grace's murder. For many months, his identity was protected by the justice process in New Zealand, but that was finally removed when he lost an appeal against his conviction and sentenced for murdering Grace. He was jailed for 17 years to run concurrently with the other two sentences of 11 years. My name is Jean, and I'm 32. Every day, I remember that night as if it were yesterday. I was 17 years old, and my mom was on vacation. We had returned from the beach a few days earlier, but because of her seniority, my mom still had a week and a half to rest. That day, my mom didn't feel like cooking, so we decided to order food. 
My nine-year-old cousin was with us, and he insisted all night that he wanted pizza, so we indulged him. While we were choosing between the pizza varieties, I left the Omegal open for my mother to entertain herself. Once we finished ordering, I walked over out of curiosity to see my mother, who was interacting with a young man, no more than 30 years old. The young man had blonde hair, and his brown eyes were shining on the monitor. The moment he saw me, he gave me a big smile and continued talking to my mother. Is this your daughter? She looks just like you. <laughs> I get that all the time. Don't we have the same nose? Yes, but I wouldn't know who is whose mother. Okay, that's enough, Casanova. Time for you to go play video games. I pulled my mom away from the computer and clicked next, but strangely, the guy was still there. Hey, it was just a joke. You shouldn't scold your mom like that. She was just having a good time. <laughs> I can see why my mother had so much fun talking. I didn't know we had a clown in the room. That's a little harsh, miss. Aren't you getting a little jealous? Okay, bye. Without waiting for his response, I tried to close the Omegle, but it still didn't react. Somewhat confused, I opened the task manager and deleted the app's window, but it still wouldn't close. At that moment, I realized that the computer was malfunctioning, as the man kept talking to me. You don't have to be jealous, you know. I like older women, but that doesn't mean I have anything against you. Although, I should wait until you turn 18. How... Anyway, the show's over, asshole. I'm taking the battery out of the notebook. I'll see you never. Are you sure your mom would like a pizza with anchovies, honey? You sure? You didn't even bother to ask her. Shocked, I stopped halfway to closing the notebook. As if the man knew what I was about to ask him, he kept talking. No, Jean, there's no way your mom knew what pizza you ordered. Nor did she tell me your name or your age. I know all this. And a lot of other things about your mom, your cousin, and you. Like your address, for example. If you dare to turn off the notebook, you'll get to know me a little better, too. The man's voice suddenly changed. His relaxed and humorous appearance had become serious and composed. This man seemed to perfectly calculate every word that came out of his mouth. W what do you want? How do you know all this? For the first time, I had lost my angry teenage tone, and my voice became shaky and timid. Suddenly, I received an attachment that I innocently opened, knowing that it could have been a virus, but it wasn't. It was a video of my mother entering the house with groceries, unaware that she was being recorded. The recording was over, and I was seeing again the inflexible face of that man who was looking at me as if he was dead. I, on the other hand, had my eyes wide open, still in shock at what I had just seen. I'm only interested in answering the first question, since at this moment, I only want you to charge the notebook, since it only has 17% of battery life. Praying the man was wrong, I checked the battery and found, to my horror, that it was true. I felt so overwhelmed that while crying, I just stood up and put the notebook to charge, while my mother watched in astonishment and my cousin kept asking for pizza. At that moment, I realized that I was facing a hacker, and I was at his mercy. Now we'll do this, little Jean. Your mom will go get the savings she has hidden in the hole in her bedroom wall. Then, she'll go downstairs and tip it to the pizza boy. She'll go back upstairs, and your cousin will enjoy the most expensive anchovy pizza of his life. How do I know they'll leave us alone after this? Girl, you've seen too many movies. Drop the heroin act and make sure you don't keep the delivery guy waiting. He's got more deliveries to make. As I turned around to talk to my mom, she already had the money, and with tears in her eyes, she told me she loved me and went downstairs to deliver it. At that moment, a second camera opened to the entrance of the apartment, where we could see that some men grabbed my mother, who, even though she screamed and resisted, could not do anything against the men who put her in a van and accelerated. As we cried, my cousin and I tried to reason with the man. Jean, what are those men doing to Auntie? My mother had all the money. Why are you doing this to us? I swear, it was all. My mom wouldn't lie about this. Don't cry, little Jean. This was never about the money. It's just a big game. And congratulations, you guys won. This was because I ordered the pizza? 
I don't want it anymore. Give me back my aunt. Guys, guys, I don't think you understand. This isn't about pizza or Omigu. If it weren't this way, you would have received an Instagram call, WhatsApp, phone call, or even a home visit. I actually have to thank you, because through Omigu, I was able to get to know you better. I still remember how desperate I was. I tried to call the police, but my phone had no signal. I tried to escape from the house, but we were locked in. I even shouted, but no neighbor approached. It was as if everyone was involved in this. After a few minutes, the man who had silently observed all our desperation spoke again. Children, it's showtime. Please look at the screen. Suddenly, another window opened, and in it was my mother. She was tied to a chair. She was in a dimly red-lit room. Then, a masked man rushed up to my mom and violently slit her throat open with a knife. My cousin and I screamed desperately in indescribable pain. It was as if the world had come crashing down on us in just two seconds. The camera was replaced with a photo of a vote that read as follows. Mother, 47%. Daughter, 31%. Child, 22%. Congratulations, little Jean. I want you to know that not everyone turns around a result in such a way, but apparently our sponsors liked you so much that they decided they wanted to see you as an orphan. Kids usually lose, especially if the parents are home to witness their punishment. Anyway, it was a good show, one of the best of the week. I wish you kids a good life. And so, as soon as it started... The nightmare ended. The next night, my aunt came to pick up her son and found out everything that had happened. She started taking care of me from then on, but a few years later, I inherited my mother's share after my grandparents passed away and I was able to live on my own. As I grew up, I didn't follow in my family's footsteps. I started studying computer security, knowing that someday, somewhere in the deep web, I will find the people who killed my mother. I work the graveyard shift at a dine-in Dunkin' Donuts. This particular Dunkin' Donuts offered free donuts and coffee to any police officer who came in as a way to thank them for their service. As a result, I grew to know just about every police officer stationed near my part of the city by name. One day, I was working the counter at the Dunkin' Donuts as usual when I received a notification on my phone. It was late into the night and there was no one in the restaurant but me, so I thought it wouldn't hurt to check my phone for a bit. It was a breaking news notification about something that had happened in my city. I tapped on it and was brought to a news article of an ongoing story. According to it, a mad gunman was on the loose somewhere in the city and had already shot and killed one police officer, but had yet to be identified. Concerning news to be sure, but I lived in a large city with millions of people, so I didn't think there was much chance of me being affected by it. Police shootings happen all the time in my country anyway, so I guess I had just grown desensitized to seeing that kind of news. Not long after I'd read that article, I heard someone enter the Dunkin' Donuts and put my phone away. A disheveled-looking police officer, wearing a uniform that looked a few sizes too big, approached the counter, still wearing his hat and sunglasses despite it being nighttime. Unlike most of my police officer customers, I didn't recognize him. I assumed that he was a newbie who had a rough first night, or someone who got transferred from a different part of the city. Good evening, officer. Rough night? You can say that. I know how to fix you up. Hang on a moment. I immediately started boxing a variety of donuts to give him. It was the same set of 12 donuts that I gave to all police officers who came by. When I was finished, I set it on the counter. This one is on the house, officer. Thank you, miss. His shoulders slumped in apparent relief. Upon closer inspection, I was able to make out a large, stitched together scar on his chin. It's the least we can do to thank you for your service. Now, how do you like your coffee? Black, please. Gotcha. Do you do this to go or dine in? Dine in. I could use a break right now. I made the officer his coffee and put it on a tray with his box of free donuts. He took the tray and made his way to the far corner of the restaurant to enjoy them. He kept his officer's hat and sunglasses on the entire time he ate for some reason. A little odd, but I wasn't about to give him grief about it. The guy seemed like he could use some peace and quiet. A little under half an hour later, a police officer I did recognize walked through the door and approached the counter looking a little worse for wear. Hey Jim, the usual today? 
Jim was fond of his jelly donuts, so I made sure to pack more jelly donuts in his set whenever he came by. Thanks, Susan, but I'm on business tonight. Is something wrong? Have you read the news about the gunman that's roaming about right now? Yeah, a little. Why? There have been reports that he came this way. Jim pulled out his phone and showed me a picture of a guy in a military dress uniform. This guy's a primary suspect right now. He's a war vet who shot a police officer during a PTSD episode. Seems like he stole the cop's uniform, too. Does this face look familiar to you? I squinted at the picture on his phone. The guy didn't ring any bells in my mind until I noticed the stitched-up scar on his chin. The same stitched-up scar I remembered seeing on the unknown police officer who came in before Jim. My blood ran cold when I realized the connection. But before I could warn him about the man eating donuts in the far corner, I felt my eardrums pop as a deafening bang rang throughout the restaurant. The sound made me flinch and close my eyes. When I opened them again, I saw Jim standing with a shocked look on his face and a bullet hole in his chest. I watched as he slumped onto the floor, his blood pooling under him. Standing behind him was the police officer from before, who I now knew was just a gunman in a stolen uniform. I raised my hands up in surrender, with eyes wide open in fear and my heart pounding out of my chest. P please don't shoot! The gunman didn't even acknowledge my existence. He just turned his back on me, walked back to the corner where his box of donuts was, and continued eating with his pistol on the table. He took his sweet time eating those donuts. Over the course of 15 minutes, police cars came and parked outside the Dunkin' Donuts. The red and blue lights blared through the windows as a police negotiator spoke to the gunman through a megaphone. They seemed to think that the gunman was keeping me hostage, which I guess was kind of true. I was too scared to make any sudden moves while I was in the gunman's shooting range, who still had his pistol within reach. So I just stood there at the counter with my hands up the entire time, hoping he wouldn't snap and decide to shoot me on a whim. I only worked up the courage to speak near the end of his meal, when he was just finishing up the last donut in his box. What are you doing? The gunman popped the last donut in his mouth, calmly wiped himself with a napkin, and picked up his pistol. I thought that I was about to die. Instead, he said something that I will never forget for the rest of my life. Finishing my last meal. And with those final words, he put the pistol to his mouth and fired. My name is Emily Miller, and for as long as I can remember, I've had a pretty shitty life. Orphaned as a child, I had to jump from one foster home to another until I was 18 when I was finally abandoned by the system and left out on the street. Living on the streets was hard, as I had to struggle for basic needs like food and shelter. But through all this, I had a reason to wake up and try again every day. And that reason was Jace Parker. Jace was literally my oldest friend. I had met him during my early days living on the street, and he began to look out for me. He always took me to the good soup kitchens whenever I was hungry and needed a warm meal. He brought me clothes whenever he got some from people's donations, and he constantly looked out for me, as the streets weren't safe for a homeless woman at night. At first, I was really skeptical about him, as I wondered why he was being so nice to me without asking for anything in return. But every time I looked into his eyes, I realized that the man called Jace Parker was just a really good person. It happened on a gloomy Thursday afternoon. Jace and I were at a soup kitchen when a strange man walked up to us. He told us his name was Mr. William Ryder and that he had a business proposition for us. Seeing as you guys are homeless, with little to no money for food or other basic needs, what if I told you that I could give you a job where all you had to do is eat? I was baffled at his offer, as it seemed extremely shady, and I knew that no one would pay people to eat free food. I told myself that there had to be a catch. The man then proceeded to show us a mukbang video. I watched as extremely frail-looking people shoved huge amounts of food down their throats. Watching, I knew that there was something odd about it, because the people in the video were eating so fast they were basically inhaling the food. They also wore loose, big clothing, and I couldn't understand why people who were eating this much food still looked frail. While it was strange, it still seemed like a tempting offer, as getting paid to eat free food was way better than what me and Jace were managing. But before I could say anything, my friend Jace said, I'll do it, but I'd like half of my pay and any leftover food from the videos to be given to my friend, Emily. 
I began to protest when he dragged me over and said, Look, Emily, we don't know who this guy is, and I know I always told you that the first rule of the street is to trust no one, but it'd be really dumb to turn down this offer. So let me do it. If I try it out and it's sketchy, I promise I'd leave and come back. But I really don't want you to do it because we don't know how the job is going to be and I want to keep you safe. I looked at him and I saw the care in his eyes, so I agreed to let him do it. We then walked back to the strange man and accepted the offer. Two weeks after that day, I had become seriously worried as I hadn't seen my friend Jace since he started working for Mr. William. The only time I saw Mr. William was at the end of the week, as he would bring coolers of food and some money that Jace sent to the shelter that I was staying at. Each time, I'd ask him questions like, How is Jace? Can I see him? When is he coming back? But Mr. William always replied with, Soon. The weeks eventually turned to months, and it finally reached a point where I couldn't take it anymore, as I knew that Jace would never abandon me or leave me alone. Even if he was sending money and food, I knew that he'd still want to see me. I had a feeling that something was wrong, so I bought a really cheap phone with some of the money I'd been getting and I looked up Mr. William's mukbang videos. I went through the recent ones and I saw Jace in most of them. He looked extremely frail and dead inside as he ravenously ate huge amounts of food. He looked thinner than before and I also noticed that he, like the rest of them, ate like their life depended on it. It was strange to me as even when we were extremely hungry on some long hard days, he never ate like that. So I waited till the end of the week, when Mr. William visited, to drop off the things Jace had sent me, and as soon as he left, I decided to follow him back, in hopes of finding where Jace was being kept. I trailed Mr. William all the way to a strange warehouse. I watched him suspiciously look around before going in. I waited a while before I managed to get into the warehouse through the back door. I got in using one of the many skills I had learned from living on the streets. As I snooped around, I passed a room that looked familiar. I soon realized it was the room where Mr. Williams' videos were filmed. I eventually reached a door where I heard numerous muffled noises coming from. The door was slightly opened, and as I got closer, I could hear someone shouting in anger. I peeked through the crevice to see what was going on, and what I saw made my skin pale. I saw numerous people stacked like sardines. Their hands and feet were tied, and the smell coming from the room was awful. They were all gagged, and they looked more dead than alive, as their obvious starvation made their skeletons incredibly visible through their paper-like skin. As I took in the scene, I noticed Mr. William in the middle of the room. He was passing out large clothing to some of the starved people, ordering them to wear it. A man who looked extremely starved began to fumble as he looked too weak to stand on his own two feet, so he fell. With no hesitation, I watched as Mr. William struck him hard with the back of his hand. The man began to bleed when Mr. William looked at him with disgust and said, Your starvation doesn't give you the right to mess up. We have a video to shoot, and I don't want any mistakes. We're falling behind on schedule, and I need to publish more videos so that I can get more money. Remember, any trouble will result in six more starvation days. So eat as much as you can, cause you never know when you're gonna have your next meal. I watched as one of the starved people rushed to help the bleeding man on the floor. He looked up at Mr. William and said, you can't do this to people. And Mr. William quickly replied with a blow to the mouth. He then got out a stick and began to beat him mercilessly. He had a sick, psychopathic grin on his face as he said, Telling me what I can and can't do, huh? Maybe eight more days of starvation will teach you a lesson. And after that, you'll realize that you stopped being people when I took you off the streets. You're nothing but a show cow to star in my videos. And the sooner you realize that, the better. I froze when my eyes finally recognized the person who was being beaten like an animal. It was my very dear friend. Jace Parker. Seeing him like that made me have a mini mental breakdown as my mind couldn't take it, so I screamed and ran to go get help. I heard people chasing after me, but I managed to make it out before I was caught. I ran all the way to the police station, screaming, and when I finally got there, I was turned away, as they all assumed I was some crazy homeless woman talking gibberish. Turned away by the law, I knew I had to do something, as no one else cared. 
My mind had put everything together. I realized that Mr. William took homeless people in under the lure of a good job, and once they agreed, he would tie them up and lock them in a warehouse. He would starve them for weeks, so that when they were finally given food, they would eat as much as they could, as they had been deprived of it. I also realized why Mr. William targeted homeless people, as he, like everyone else, knew that no one would care if one of us went missing. So I decided to share my story with the world, in hopes that someone would do something to help me get justice for Jace and all the other people who are still under Mr. William's captivity to this very day. It was late night when I got an alert on my phone. I could not believe it. I had just matched on Tinder with the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. She was a 21-year-old blonde called Valerie. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I should have suspected that something was up right from the get-go. I'm not what you'd usually consider attractive, not like the other guys on Tinder. I look normal. If I were hanging out at a bar and I strike up a conversation with someone, I think I'd have a decent shot at any girl there, but on these dating apps, it's all about the looks. And a decent six like me doesn't usually match with a glowing 10. And it's even stranger when it's her making the first move. Hey, handsome. Nice pics. I replied immediately, surprised that she'd be the first to break the ice, and we started talking. Turns out we were attending the same university, and even though she was a medical student, our schedules were pretty similar. After a few days of great, long conversations, I finally went for it and asked her out for coffee. She said yes, and we met that Friday after school. I met Valerie in a bookshop cafe near campus. She looked as stunning as she did in her profile, and she was just as charming. It was summer, and she was wearing a nice sundress that nicely complemented her figure. But what caught my attention mostly was the strange necklace she wore. It had a strange circular symbol with small blue rocks embedded into it. When I asked about it, she sort of dodged the question. Ugh, this old thing? It belonged to my grandmother, but I don't want to talk about it. She looked nervous for a second, but then she went back to her usual charming self. We kept talking, having fun with stories about school, when I noticed a man on a far table staring at us. No, staring at me. The man had a strange looking face. It was weird that I hadn't noticed him until then. He was wearing all black, and I couldn't really tell from a distance, but it looked like he was wearing a necklace and it looked similar to Valerie's. He had half his face scarfed as if he'd been terribly burnt and he really looked out of place in the cafe. When he realized I was staring at him, he looked down to his phone, but later I caught him staring at me several times. I was kind of freaked out, so I decided to cut it short. I was feeling very strange. Valerie was nice, maybe too nice, and this other guy, was really intimidating. So I made an excuse and left. Before leaving the cafe, Valerie gave me her Instagram and asked me to follow her. So I did. On my way home, I scrolled through her feed. If I didn't know she was a medical student, I'd assume she was a supermodel by the looks of her feed. Many, many provocative pictures, and she always looked great on all of them. Later that night, she texted me. Hey, it was weird the way you left today. I hope I didn't do anything to upset you. I replied that I was okay. I was just feeling a little strange and had to get out of there. But that she was great and that I'd love to see her again. Oh, great, because I know it's kind of too soon for a second date, but a friend is playing a show with her band tonight and I'm looking for a plus one. Would you be interested? I could not resist. I said yes and began putting together an outfit. I left that night and I saw something strange outside of my apartment a black SUV, and the man at the wheel was looking at me. I didn't get a good look at him. It was too dark, and he pulled up the window when he caught me staring. I began walking to the bus stop. I could swear someone was following me. I'd hear steps behind me, rushing suddenly, only to turn around and see no one there. I looked back at my building, and the SUV had disappeared. But I never heard the engine. I told myself I was imagining things. The bus arrived, and I got on. And that's when I realized that something terrible was going to happen. Valerie was standing there in the bus between the row of seats. I was shocked to see her. That was a coincidence, right? I turned and looked, and the bus driver was the guy. The same guy from the coffee shop with his horribly scarred face and a terrible smile on his lips. Valerie said, I'm so glad you made it. 
She had a sickening grin on her face. There were other people in the bus, all men, all wearing black and with the same necklace she had around their necks. Suddenly, I felt the urge to run, to jump, but the bus was on the move and someone was behind me. One of the men grabbed me and Valerie walked up to me with a needle in her hand. She stabbed me with it and everything went black. I woke up in a dark room. I could hear people chanting in some weird language in the distance. The room had wooden walls and there was a carving of the same symbol in the necklace they all wore. I had been kidnapped by some strange cult. I had to get out of there. A knock came at the door. It was Valerie. She was wearing a dark robe now and her hair had strands of red wet with blood. She was holding a bloody knife too, as if she'd just killed someone. The mother will be ready for you soon, she said and walked away shutting the door behind her. I was trembling with fear, but I wouldn't let these psychos kill me just like that. I explored the room carefully. It had no windows and it was almost empty. I inspected the wood on the walls. There were several boards placed vertically, one next to the other. I fiddled with them until I noticed one in particular was kind of flimsy. I pulled on it gently and I was able to pull it back a little. The wall inside was hollow and the space was just enough for me since I was so skinny. I managed to pull the plank all the way without breaking it and I got inside the wall. Then I pulled the plank back in place. About 20 minutes later, I heard the door open and then shouting. A male voice said, Where is he? Valerie was also there. He was right here, I swear. Spread out and find him. Mother will be angry if we let anyone go. The man said, and soon everyone had abandoned the room. But I didn't hear the door close. I waited a minute and exited the wall. As I suspected, the door was open. But I could hear people coming and going outside. I exited the room and found another door open down the hall. I got in and I found it was some sort of storage room. There were robes and books there. I took a robe and disguised myself as one of them. I also saw there were several knives and other objects I could use to defend myself. So I took a small blade. It would work. I had never hurt anyone before, but I was decided to escape that place. I went outside. I had the knife hidden in my sleeve. The house looked like an old manor, the kind you see in old timey horror movies and there was so much chaos around that nobody seemed to mind me. There were people in robes running up and down the hallways, so I tried to imitate them, keeping my head low under the hood of my cloak and grasping the knife tight. I started making my way down a huge staircase. I could see the front door of the house. I was about to escape when I heard a shout behind me. It was her. I turned around and there was an old lady behind Valerie. I suppose that's the mother but I had no time to find out. I rushed to the door and made it outside with what seemed to be all members of the cult following me. I saw there were expensive cars parked outside. Some of them looked like European models. These people, whoever they were, had money. There was a man smoking a cigarette next to one of the sports cars. The car's door was open. So I threatened him with the knife until he gave me the keys. I got into the driver's seat and broke through the front gates. I could hear the other cars behind me, but this thing was fast, so I quickly lost them. After all that happened, I moved back across the country. I decided to stay with some relatives for a while. I went to the cops, but they told me that when they went to the house, it looked like it had been abandoned years ago. I told them it couldn't be because it was full of people, but they assured me that there was nothing wrong. To this day, part of me is always looking over my shoulder hoping the cult never catches up to me. I know they're still out there. All I know for certain is this. I'm never going anywhere near those damn apps ever again. I got a really shitty SUV from my uncle on my 21st birthday. I hated it because it was huge and bulky. To me, it looked like a family car. And I told myself, that it wasn't really what a 21 year old should be driving. So I decided to use it as an Uber driver to make some money to get a flashy sports car. So I cleaned it up, made sure it was in good condition, and once everything was checked out, I began driving as an Uber XL driver. 
As being an SUV, I could use the car to carry more passengers and make more money. I worked my butt off all through the summer, and after a while, I was finally able to get all the money I wanted. I just needed two more rides to reach my goal. It was on a Sunday on a sunny afternoon when I got a ride request to carry five people. I quickly accepted, and on my way to pick up the first person, I looked at the destination and saw that they were all going to the outskirts of the city, which was by the forest path. It was weird as I began to wonder what five people were going to be doing all the way out there surrounded by nothing but the forest. But the thought of getting paid and cruising in a new car removed all my curiosity, so I drove on with a smile on my face. I remember rolling up to pick up the first passenger. She was an elderly woman who wore a dark robe with short sleeves. She was also putting on dark makeup on her face, so it gave her a gothic look. I noticed she had a belated look on her face as if she was going to see something beautiful. I then asked her, did you order the Uber? She said nothing as she just nodded her head in response. She looked pretty elderly, so I got out of the car to open the door for her. As she walked in, I noticed that there were numerous scars on her hands and arms, but I didn't say anything about it. When she had settled in, I got back into my car and continued the journey. The car was weirdly quiet as the elderly woman didn't say a single word on the way to pick the next passenger. The second passenger was a woman in her 20s, as she too domed a similar black robe to the one the old woman was wearing. She also had the dark makeup, gothic look, with similar scarring on her hands and arms. When she got into the car, she looked at the elderly woman and said, Greetings, follower. And with that, nothing but silence followed. On the way to pick up the third passenger, the silence in the car was making me feel anxious. My mind began going to numerous places as I wondered why they were dressed like that and what were they going to do. So I asked, are you guys cosplayers? Nothing but silence answered me as they completely ignored my question. As I picked up the remaining three passengers, I began to get more anxious as things were getting weirder. The third passenger was a middle-aged man who wore the same robe and makeup as the females. The fourth was a teenage boy who also sported the same attire and makeup. And the fifth was a little girl who looked like she was 14. She too, like the rest of them, was wearing the exact same thing. It was already evening by the time I picked them all up. I thought about canceling the ride as something didn't feel right, but I really wanted the money. So I carried on with the trip. We drove for a while and I noticed that none of them used their phones, which was odd for people in the 21st century. They also didn't speak much. And when they did, they spoke weirdly. It began to get pretty late as I drove deeper into the forest. So I asked, are you guys sure it's this way? That's when the elderly woman touched my shoulder and said in a really soft voice, Take us to the path that's green, to one who needs to be seen. Shocked by her weird response, I watched as they all began to chat the weird mantra continuously. Take, Take us, us to, to the, the path that's green, green, to one, one who needs to be seen. seen. As they repeatedly Take chanted their the weird poem in unison, I began to feel suffocated as their odd behavior was creeping me out. After a while, I couldn't take it anymore as I began to freak out. So I hastily pulled over and stopped the ride. Immediately, they all stopped reciting the mantra and they began to stare at me. I then told them, I'm not sure I want to continue this ride. You guys are making me uncomfortable with that weird poem you're reciting. The little girl beside me then said, Move, child and I will give you huge worldly earnings. Stunned, I looked at her with a perplexed look on my face as the girl who I was sure was 14 or 15 called me child like she was 60. I then replied her with, you mean a tip? She then proceeded to bring out $600. And once I saw the money, it's as if my mind went blank as I knew that the tip would be enough to complete my savings without having to go on another ride. So against better judgment, I accepted. We reached the destination on the map and they told me to go a bit further off the road and into the forest as their true destination wasn't on the map. I knew something was really shady about it, but I really wanted the $600, so I agreed. I drove off the road and into the forest. It was pretty dark when we reached our destination. There was a clearing in the forest and in the middle, numerous people donning the same dark robes were gathered. They all carried torches and they surrounded a huge mound of wood there was something at the top of it that I couldn't see. 
As I took in the scene, I realized I had come to a cult gathering. They paid me and began to get out. When they had all left, I immediately started to back up when I heard someone slip my tires. The door was forcefully opened and a huge man looked at me and said, join us. I immediately replied him with, I really don't want to join any clubs. I just want to go home. But before I could say anything else, I was forcefully pulled out of my car. The huge man began to pull me towards the middle of the gathering as they encircled me. I began to scream and fight back when another huge man came to subdue me. I was then gagged and taken to the foot of the wooden mound. Now that I was closer, I could see what was on top as it was the skull of a ram. But what was horrifying about the animal's skull was that instead of two eye sockets, it only had one which meant that the animal was alive and it only had one huge eye in the middle of its head. I started to scream as my mind couldn't comprehend the sight of the morbid skull. The head of the colt then walked up to me and said, Remove that scornful look on your face, as you have been chosen for this great day. You have been presented unto the one who sees all, a great honor to behold. You will be eaten by his four-legged children, and you will be his glorious sacrifice. Cheers erupted all around me as I continued to scream. A bucket was then brought out, and each of them took out a knife. One by one, they began to slightly slit their arms and hands, and they took turns spilling blood into the bucket. They all did this till the bucket was full to the brim. The leader then carried the bucket and emptied it on my head. I screamed and struggled, but they held me down. I watched the two huge men come towards me with huge sticks, and they began to continuously strike my legs. The pain was unbearable as I felt and heard my legs break. They stopped when they were sure I couldn't move. And one by one, I watched as they all left me there in the darkness. I knew it was only a matter of time before the blood that was poured on me attracted the dangerous forest animals. I could already hear the howling of wolves in the distance. I didn't want to die, so I began to frantically look around. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see the silhouette of my SUV. I noticed the door I was pulled out of was still open. I never in a million years thought that seeing the car I thought was ugly would give me so much hope. I told myself it wasn't that far, so I began to crawl towards it. Till today, I don't know how I did it, but I mustered all the strength I could, and I started to crawl. As I crawled on the floor, I felt a whole world of pain. I felt the stones dig into my belly. I felt the ants and mosquitoes feast on my flesh, but I didn't give up. I eventually reached the SUV and I pulled myself into the driver's seat. I managed to stay the night in the safety of the SUV and in the morning, I was found by a hiker who immediately called 911. I woke up in the hospital, surrounded by my family and the cops. The cops then told me I had a run-in with a notorious cult called The Followers of the One Who Sees. They said the cult was over a hundred years old and I was lucky enough to be alive. An investigation was then opened to find the ones responsible. When they were done with questioning me, the doctors then told me that my legs were broken, not shattered. So with time, I'd heal and walk again. It's been three years since this happened. I didn't get the flashy car I wanted as I kept the SUV that basically saved my life. I've been working through the trauma, but till today, I can never forget that day, and sometimes, when I close my eyes, I still see a one-eyed ram staring right at me. I've never shared this story before because the memory of it disturbs me. English isn't my native language, so bear with me. I'll try my best. This story is creepy to me, but isn't the craziest story out there. It's just something that happened to me and my ex-best friend three years ago on our trip to New York. For the sake of the story, let's call him Ralph. So Ralph and I met in our first year of college. He was from California while I was from Germany. I couldn't click with many people, so he was the only friend I had, but we never hung out before. So it was our first trip. We were laughing and drinking beer while Ralph drove the car. Empty highway surrounded by endless green fields and the bright sky. It was 5 p.m. on a summer day, so the daylight was still out there. But as we drove for a half an hour or more, a patch of dark cloud covered the sky. It all got dark and lightning struck, 
and within the next few minutes, heavy rain started. The view outside the windshield got blurry immediately. It was becoming too difficult to see on the road outside. Dude, I can't drive like this. We have to stop. Saying this, he slowed down the car at the side of the road. We waited inside the car for the rain to slow down. The constant sound of the wipers sweeping the glass started to irritate me. Boo! What the? <laughs> Dude, look at your face! Not funny, Ralph. Where are we anyway? I don't know. There's no network here. I have to get out and see. Let the rain slow down a bit. What a weather. Out of no other option, we waited inside the car. After 10 minutes, the rain started to slow down and we saw a vibrant light going on and off at some distance. It once turned purple, then yellow. I wiped the windshield to rub off the moisture on the glass. It was a big signboard of Dunkin' Donuts blinking at us. Thank God, I was so hungry. Let's go inside. I too was relieved that for the night we got a roof over our head because it would have been difficult to find the right way because I was sure we were lost. We got out the car. I closed my door and turned around to see an ugly looking black dog standing out there. One of his eyes was closed and his teeth were broken. His chunks of hair were missing from his body. We realized it was living his last days. I slowly walked past it when the dog growled in a low voice. Ralph and I turned back. The dog was standing near our car. Its one leg was close to the tire, giving the proper vibe that it's going to pee on our tire. Hey, shoo! Shoo! Go away! Let it be. I think it's a mad dog. He's going to ruin my car! Shoo! Shoo! Ralph tried to scare off the dog, but the dog still peed on the tire. Being all angry and frustrated, he picked up a rock from the ground and threw it, aiming at the dog's head. The rock did hit the dog, and with a short squeaky sound, everything got silent. I was completely disgusted to see this scenario. Ralph casually went to the car, moved its body using a stick, and came back to me. <sighs> Let's go. I didn't say anything, probably getting a bit disturbed after seeing this. We went inside the donut shop. Ralph went to order coffee and some donuts while I sat at the chair. The empty high road was standing out there, quietly. There was a lamp post at the corner. I kept staring at it when a tall, bony man came out from the dark and stood under it. He was wearing a brown hat, old brown coat, and black trousers. Nothing was striking in his appearance except his face. His one eye was closed with a broken set of teeth, just like that dog. His eyes were so bright that they glowed. He wasn't blinking, just standing there, staring at me. I wasn't able to take my eyes off him until Ralph called out to me. Leon, I'm having a latte. What will you have? Huh, yeah, same for me. When I looked back at the lamppost, the man was gone. I searched around, but didn't see him. A few moments later, the rain started again, and Ralph came back with the food. I quietly drank my coffee, while Ralph went on blabbering about how he had no other way than killing the dog. All of a sudden, the shop door opened, and to my shock, that dog-faced man walked in. Ralph followed my eye and noticed the man too. Damn, isn't that guy? Looks like that dog, yes. The man walked to the counter and handed the employee a dirty $10 bill. The employee seemed casual about it though. He gave him a cup of coffee and some donuts. The man picked up his food and sat right next to us. Ralph and I looked at each other and started to eat the donuts. We knew we were stuck here for a while, so it will be better to avoid any more trouble. We were eating silently when a loud smacking sound took place. I realized it was the man eating the donuts. I looked at him and he started eating more aggressively. He was shoving the donuts inside his mouth and crushing it with his dirty, bony hands. What the hell he eating like that? I don't know, I think we should leave. What? It's still raining outside. I can't drive in such weather. It's too risky. Fine, then just be quiet until he leaves. The man finished all the donuts and then gave me a big smile. There were chunks of chewed donuts hanging in his broken teeth. I immediately turned my face away from him to prevent myself from vomiting. The man got up and then walked out the door. We exhaled a sigh of relief that finally that creep is gone. 
The rain went on for a few minutes more, and then finally stopped. We too came out of the Dunkin' Donuts outlet and started to walk back to our car. I have only taken a step or two when Ralph grabbed my hand and said, Did you hear that? Hear what? What are you saying? Quiet! Listen. I listened carefully, and then I heard it. Someone or something was growling at us from the darkness. We increased our pace and started walking faster. We were about to get in the car when a big rock came flying at Ralph, and he moved back in reflex. The rock missed him and shattered the driver's side window, creating a loud noise. The Dunkin' Donut employee came out hearing it. We didn't move an inch, as we weren't expecting something like this at all. The employee asked, What happened? Just then, a howl came from the darkness, and we saw that man jumping from a bushy tree and then disappearing into the darkness again. What the hell is wrong with that guy? Oh, him. He is only a nut job. Calls himself some famous magician. He says he can turn into any animal. What? Yeah, but he doesn't do anything until you bother him. How are you not freaked out by this guy? Um, I used to be, but then we kind of got along. He comes in, hands money, eats his food, and leaves. Honestly, he never bothered me. Anyways, drive safe, you guys. Good night. Visit again if you come by this way. Maybe then I can make you his friends. The donut guy went back, and we were completely clueless after hearing this guy. Friend? Who wants to befriend a creepy homeless man that looks like a psycho? Ralph and I are not in contact anymore. But last year, I read a pretty weird story in the newspaper. The story was a homeless guy murdering a boy in a Dunkin' Donuts shop during his graveyard shift. The boy was 22 years old, said to have been working there for a year. The police couldn't find this man. They only found CCTV footage. In that footage, this man can be seen entering the shop and then grabbing the boy's neck and breaking it while staring at the camera. Local people said he is a homeless guy who roams the highway at night. To some people, he claimed himself to be a famous magician. He also told that he had this weird power of turning himself into any animal, mostly to a black dog. The police are sure that this man is nothing but a psycho murderer, making all these bullshit stories to save himself. But they are going to find him soon and put him behind bars. What do you think? Was he a dog or a man? Or someone who can turn into both?